can hear you, Andy. Do you want me to start broadcasting? Um, so I, the only way people can hear me is if I talk on the phone? Do you have it on speakerphone? I think you did it on speaker last time, and that worked. Can people hear me? Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, I'm sorry. I'm so used to being able to just use my computer audio that I forgot that I needed to call in. So I'm going to call the meeting to order, uh, the uh, June 4th, 2020 meeting of the uh, Santa Cruz City Planning Commission. Could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Here. Greenberg? Here. Spellman? Here. Maxwell? Here. Nielsen? Here. Dawson? Here. Chair Schifrin? Here. So are there any statements of disqualification? Hearing none, uh, are there any uh, members of the public on the line who might want to do oral communication? Who's manning the phones for the staff? I am. Um, remind the uh, members of the public, please, Chair, to raise their hand if they wish to speak on an item. So I'll know that they're here to speak to the item and not just be present to hear. Okay, so we're at all communications, and this is the time for anyone to talk about it before the Planning Commission tonight, and but is uh, an item that you know, I believe for us. Are there any oral communications? Yes, we have one, Chair. Okay, uh, please uh, identify yourself, and you have up to three minutes. I see that the attendees raised their hand, but they're not. A uh, person calling from the 916 number, did you wish to speak at oral communications? Talk. Thank you. Uh, only a comment uh, when needed on Carbonero. Okay. Thank you. There are no other speakers on the line, Chair. Okay. Uh, move on to announcements. Are there any announcements? Are there any presentations? I haven't heard of any, so I assume there aren't. Um, we'll now move to the approval of the minutes. We'll go first to the approval of the minutes of April 16, 2020. Uh, is there, are there any comments on the minutes? Somebody like to move approval I have, of the minutes? I have a question. I, I just have a quick question. I, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm not reading this properly, but um, let's see, for the air circle, um, item that we heard the I'm not sure if we it, it looks like there was two motions within that and with an action but there was only one action but I saw two motions but only one action so are we missing an action here in terms of the actual vote for the um, for the item I'm glad you mentioned that because as I remember it, there was a motion and then there was an amendment to the motion and that was then uh, accepted into the motion with some jiggling. Um, but the minute and I, does, it, it, it does not reflect it, that, it, it, I think it should. Okay. Is that how you? Um, well, it appears that there, it, it appears the amendment may have made it in there, but, um, but w w involving, um, the, the common use building and, and um, uh, regarding the, um, um, sorry, just, to, you know, it, it, I, I, think the, I think they made it in there, but the, it shows that there was a motion made for this, you know, it, originally there was a motion made that was to extend the meeting, and it looked like there was action taken on that, but then there was a motion for the actual item, but it doesn't, in the meeting minutes, it doesn't show that there was uh, any action taken on that motion. So I'm just wondering if I'm misunderstanding that or something else. This is the clerk. May I speak? 
Yes, go ahead. Would you like to pull the minutes and I can um, review that and prepare verbatim and then bring it back to your next meeting? Okay, is there a motion to um, continue the uh, continue the minutes of April 4, uh, 16th to the next meeting so we can get, uh, be sure to have any clarifications made that need to be made? Yeah, I'll go ahead and move to, um, to pull the minutes and have that amendment made to reflect um, the motion that I made and the d discussion around that. Is there a second to that? I'll second. A second. <clears throat> I think that um, uh, Commissioner Nielsen seconded it and uh, Commissioner Dawson made the motion. I got it right. Um, is there any discussion? Oh, uh, let's have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Chair Schiffer? Aye. So the minutes from April 16th have been continued to our next meeting, and now we move on to the approval of the special meeting minutes of May 22nd. Are there any comments on the minutes? Anybody like to make a motion to approve them? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? A second. Uh, moved by Commissioner Spellman, seconded by uh, Commissioner Nielsen to approve the minutes of May 22nd. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Aye. Greenberg? I was not present, so I can't, I think, approve. Is that right? You're abstaining. I'm, I abstain. And Commissioner Spellman? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Chair Schifrin? Aye. Um, we don't have a consent agenda, so we'll move to public hearings under general business, 238 Carbonara Drive. Um, could we please have a staff report? Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so this is, um, I'm Clara Finger, senior planner. Um, this is um, a project for a single family home at 38 Carbon Air Drive. So, the location you can see um, outlined in red right here. Um, this lot is the last undeveloped lot from a subdivision that created the lots that run along the south and west side of Carbonara Drive right here. Um, the lots in this area all have similar constraints with regard to trees and steep slopes. The west side of this site, or kind of the west and south side of the site, um, and um, west of the other houses is a large parcel that's owned by the city. Um, that parcel includes Carbonara Creek, which you can see running through the west side of that lot, so pretty far away from the site in question. And the other houses that have been developed within this subdivision are uh, pretty much all two stories tall. They range from about 2,500 to 3,000 square feet in size, um, and they're all located on or adjacent, adjacent to steep slopes. So this site um, is 16,920 square feet. The zoning is R17, which has a standard lot size of 7,000 square feet um, and accommodates single family residential development. There are several heritage trees on the site, including a redwood grove that you can see right here um, on the eastern side of the site. The western side of the site is more disturbed and it involves some unsolated grading that was done by a neighbor in the past. The site is also mapped with sensitive archaeological resources. Um, however, an archaeological investigation found there is a very low probability of um, resources being present on this site. Most of the site is also steeply <laughs> cut. 
Um, and the proposal is it's okay. That's a three thousand two hundred. It's okay. He'll come. Five bedroom single family home. So here we can see um, the existing slope conditions that were mapped by Bowman and Williams. The orange areas indicate slopes exceeding 30%, and the gray areas indicate slopes exceeding 50%. Um, as you can see, there's a flatter area at the um, rear left side of the site here. Um, that's the area where the neighbor had graded the site. Um, this was associated with an unpermitted skateboard ramp that was um, required to be removed as part of a code enforcement case. Um, so grading caused this area to be flatter on the site, and in this area that um, just down slope of it to become steeper than what was originally there. Um, there's also a steep area adjacent to the street where the, slight, the site dips down and then back up. Um, this was created by um, the grading that was done when the road was built. So Bowman and Williams also did a slope map of um, forensic slope conditions to show what the slope would have looked like without the man-made grading that occurred on the site. So as you can see, uh, pretty much the whole western side of the site now has slopes greater than 30%, um, but pretty much no part of this is greater than 50%. Um, in addition, the area next to the street uh, would have had slopes less than 30% if it weren't for that grading for the road. So, Zoning ordinance section 2414031 exempts minor sculpted landforms from the provisions of the slope ordinance. This is important in this case um, because the slope ordinance requires the net lot area to exclude areas of 30% or greater slope, and it also prohibits construction on slopes over 50%. So, the forensic slope survey shows a net lot area of 3,983 square feet. That's still less than the 7,000 square feet for a standard lot in the R17 zone district. Um, so that means this lot is considered substandard for net lot area and a design permit is required to build a house. Design permit findings will look for a house and site plan that has a consistent design um, that's appropriate given any site conditions such as topography, and is compatible with the surrounding area. You can see on the slope survey the outline of the um, driveway right here and the proposed house behind it. Um, as you can see, under natural conditions before the man-made grading was done, this entire area has slopes less than 50%, which means it would not be prohibited to build at this location. Um, but it does include slopes over 30 percent, which means that a slope variance is required to build a house. So to meet the findings for a slope variance, um, you have to show that an exception to the slope regulations is needed to allow um, the property owner to exercise their property rights, and um, also look for things that, such as um, the site plan providing an appropriate amount of landscaping and usable open space. So as you can see, in this case, there's so much slope on the property that it sees 30%. It would be um, virtually impossible to construct a house um, without going on or within 10 feet of the 30% slope, which is the threshold for slope variance. So here's a um, proposal to slice um, the site layout. It's turned a little bit in the site plan. Um, so the, the proposed house is on the northwestern side of the site, um, which here is shown at the top of the site plan. Uh, the proposal proposes to keep the existing landscaping on the site, which is kind of a wooded hillside. Um, as you can see, the gray dots on the screen, those all represent trees. So right here we have a grove of heritage coast redwood trees um, located just below or just next to the house on the screen. Um, there were also two other heritage trees, um, an oak tree and a California Bay laurel tree within the footprint of the proposed driveway. Those trees were removed with a heritage tree removal permit in 2018. However, since their removal was related to the proposed house location, 
um, I did consider their removal in the analysis for this project. So the decision to allow these two trees to be removed stems from the site constraints. Um, there's really no physical way to develop the site without removing any heritage trees. The eastern side of the site, which is the bottom part of the site plan here, has very steep slopes um, that would prohibit construction. Um, and then in the middle of the site, we have this um, grove of post redwood trees. And the city arborist ultimately determined that this grove was more important to retain than the two trees um, that were removed. And so that's kind of how that decision came to be made. Um, beyond the removal of those two trees, there are no additional trees that are proposed to be removed for the project. In addition, um, the project arborist, Kurt Fout, has reviewed the proposed project and provided recommendations to um, protect the existing heritage trees on the site. Um, those recommendations have been reviewed by the city arborist and they are included as conditions of approval for the project. So here's a, a kind of side version of the house in relation to the slope. You can see the dash line is the existing slope topography and the proposed house really minimizes any grading on the site. Um, the driveway will be either supported on tiers or it will have a built up gravel and concrete foundation but it's not going to um, cut into the slope at all. Um, the house itself has a tier foundation and it will step up the hillside. So this is the first floor of the of the house and then here's the first floor of the back. So it steps up right there. Um, so it's really not going to cut into the grade at all. And that keeps it in conformance with the natural grade as called for in the design permit findings and also the first slope variant. So here we see the front elevation of the house. Um, there is a two-car garage at the front of the house, and then the driveway also accommodates two cars, um, and that meets the four-car parking space requirement for the project. This is the left side of the house. Um, as you can see, a consistent design is carried around the house. We have vertical board and batten siding on the first floor, um, and Harvey lot siding um, on the second floor. These materials help to visually break up the first and second floor. And um, kind of create a horizontal break visually in the mapping of the house. Also, with stepping the house up the whole side, it visually breaks up the house vertically, although um, you probably won't see a whole lot of this from the street view. Now, as you can see, there's also quite a few um, balconies and decks proposed on the house. Um, these will help to ensure open space for the residents. Um, also, the first floor at the back of the house opens up onto that ladder area of the lot that was previously graded um, for that skateboard ramp. And so that um, will provide some private open space for the residents too. So here we see the back of the house. The design is carried consistently around the back. And then again on the left elevation. Um, as you can see, the second floor of the house is the same size as the first floor underneath. Zoning Ordinance Section 24.08.440.2 states that if the first floor of the house of a substandard lot exceeds 30% of the net lot area, the second floor is limited to half the size of the first floor. So in this case, a variance is needed uh, to that section to allow the second floor to exceed this limit. To meet the findings for a variance, there must be a hardship unique to the property. Um, the variance must be needed to allow the owner to exercise substantial property rights, and the variance must not create a privilege not granted to the neighbors. So in this case, um, the site is substandard um, because of the net lot area, not the total lot area, um, because of the amount of steep slope on the site, which is considered to be an unusual circumstance. Um, the Buildable area is also constrained by several heritage trees, um, such as this redwood grove, um, so that it kind of really makes it impossible, due to those two constraints, to expand the first floor of the house, um, which would reduce the second floor and create a better ratio. Um, 
The lot itself is pretty big at nearly 17,000 square feet, and it's in a neighborhood that has larger lots and houses that are spaced out pretty far from each other. Um, the proposed house is 87 feet and 150 feet from the two houses on either side. Um, and it's also buffered by the wooded environment, so there's really no um, questions regarding privacy between addition, um, the adjacent neighbors. Um, therefore, any concerns associated with crowding or with privacy on, on truly small lots, um, which is kind of the driving intent behind those limitations, that really doesn't apply in this case. Um, allowing a full second floor in a house does not constitute a privilege not granted to other properties and under similar circumstances. Um, I did some research on these four properties um, leading uh, north and westward on Carbonero Drive directly um, adjacent to this property. Um, these lots all have a similar size. They all range from about 15 to 18,000 square feet. Um, they have similar constraints with regard to slopes and trees. The houses are all similar in size as a proposed house. They're all around 2,500 to 3,000 square feet. Um, they're all constructed within 30% slope, and they all have second floors that are about the same size as the first floor. And therefore, allowing the variance for this house would actually keep it right in alignment with the other houses in the area. In conclusion, Planning staff um, recommends that the Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the project with recommended conditions. Um, I want to note that I received five comment letters with concerns about um, preserving the existing budget growth, slope stability, and the CEQA exemption determination. As mentioned earlier, the project preserves the budget trees um, and also requires the project to follow recommendations to um, protect those trees. Um, there's also a condition of approval requiring the applicant to follow recommendations from their geotechnical engineer to ensure slope stability on the site. Um, one of the comment letters questions the categorical exemption um, under CEQA guidelines section 15303, um, which is for a new single family dwelling. Um, the letter had concerns of the slope removal of two heritage trees and potential habitat for two animal species created in unusual circumstances um, in CEQA terms that would disqualify the planet from exemption. Um, with regard to the slope and heritage tree removal, um, neither of those are considered an unusual circumstances for CEQA um, in that both of those circumstances are already addressed through general plan policies um, and through the zoning ordinance and municipal code. Um, the letter stated a concern that there may be habitat on the site for two species, the Bionte bandwing grasshopper and the fancy kangaroo rat. The grasshopper is listed under the Endangered Species Act, while the rat does not appear to be a listed species under federal or state law. Um, it appears that these two species are found in sandhill habitat, um, which is further up in the Santa Cruz Mountains and not present on the site. Um, in addition, the Fish and Wildlife Service critical habitat designation for the grasshopper does not include the project area. Um, in addition, neither of these species is known as present or even potentially present within city limits, um, according to the steep analysis prepared for the city's general plan. Therefore, um, staff found no evidence that such habitat exists on the property. Um, so that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Do any members of the uh, commission have just questions for staff? Well, I have a few questions. Um, let me first say that my phone has a lousy speaker, so um, I, the I wasn't always clear on everything that was in the staff report, so I apologize if I ask questions that you already answered. But was a biotic study done for this site? No, a biotic study was not done. The site is not mapped uh, for biotic resources, um, and there's no indication that there are any sense of biotic resources on the site. Okay, and then um, you mentioned that there wasn't much grading. How how much grading will be done? Uh, is there very much cut and fill that's going to be required for the site? 
I got confused because I didn't know what forensic slope diagram was all about. So I might have misunderstood with that. Um, okay. So the proposed, the proposed rating is very minimal. Um, the house is going to be built on a pure foundation, so there's probably you know they're going to drill some piers. Um, the um, driveway might be on piers or it might have like a built up pad so it would not actually grade into the slope. Um, I believe they're going to be doing a very small retaining wall around the side of part of the house that might grade it um, just a very small area for it to create a little pathway around the side of the house. So and in terms of. Again, cut and fill. I'm sorry? There's not going to be significant cut and fill. Yeah. And then I, in terms of the forensic slope study, that just showed that there's grading that has already been done on the site. So that just showed, it did like a forensic analysis to show what the site would have looked like before that grading happened. Okay, I, I think I understand that now. I also had a question about the heritage trees. It wasn't clear from the staff report um, how many uh, redwood trees were going to be cut? Does did I understand it that the uh, staff report said there were 15 heritage trees on the site and 12 were coast redwoods? And the artist uh, recommends uh, actions to protect six of the heritage coast redwoods. Does that mean that the other six are going to be uh, cut? It wasn't yeah. clear. Any redwood trees would be uh, cut down. Okay, so so there's the proposal is to cut zero redwood trees. Um, two trees which are not redwood trees were removed. There's one heritage tree that is remaining that's not a redwood tree. Um, some of the redwood trees need to be protected during construction because they're near the proposed house. The rest of the trees are farther away and don't need specific protection measures. So none of the redwood trees are proposed to be cut. How, how many how many trees will be um, cut as part of this project? So two trees were removed in 2018, which were related to the project, and there are no more trees that will be cut down related to this project. Okay. Um, boy, I really didn't understand the, the staff report around the trees. Sorry about that. Um, okay, uh, if there are no more uh, questions from commissioners, uh, uh, are there any members of the public who would like to speak to this item? Mm -hmm. You have three minutes. There is one member of the public. I'll go ahead and I, I believe it's the applicant. I'll go ahead and unmute them. I think there was somebody who wanted to talk to it. Yes. Uh, tried to talk during all communication. Uh, yes, Chair, this is the clerk. There is one member of the public. I believe it's the applicant. You're on the line. Uh, yes, uh, this is Dave Morris. I'm the uh, owner applicant of the, the property there. And um, uh, it just uh, highlights on here that 238 Club Narrow is over a third acre of land, about 16,920 square feet. It has 125 feet of street frontage. When the home is built, it'll provide an abundance of on-street and off-street parking, and this is a neighborhood of large lots with no parking congestion. All the utilities were connected to the property at the back of the uh, existing sidewalk in 1979 when the subdivision was created, and there will be no excavation in the street to make any utility connections. <clears throat> All of the heritage trees will be preserved and protected as specified in the Arborist Report Tree Preservation uh, as shown in the report uh, uh, 2J. Uh, there are 20, uh, actually on the whole lot, the map you have shows the area of building that shows 15 trees. On the whole lot, there are 27 heritage redwood trees, two bay trees, and one heritage fir tree today, all of which will be protected. Uh, the 144-foot uh, rear property line borders about 14 uh, acres of open space for city property. Our landscape plan is to preserve all the heritage trees and preserve the natural setting of the property. <clears throat> this house design 
complies with all of the city council's development guidelines and staff recommendations that were made when they approved the original Carbonero Woods subdivision in 1979. Prior to that approval, all environmental concerns were addressed in great detail and the engineers had to document that all lots were over 7,000 square feet of net lot area. But because of the grading in here, we were unable to recertify uh, that number. <clears throat> the house design complies with all of the, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, the 17 exhibits attached with this application represent the work product of reports, tests, maps, surveys, and studies completed by a long list of licensed professionals, which includes civil engineers, geotechnical engineers, structural engineers, arborists, buildings designers, and surveyors. These professionals certify the quality of design and the integrity of construction of the project. Um, in response to the, the letters uh, from the neighbors and their concerns uh, regarding tree removal, uh, we're not asking for the removal of any of the 30 existing heritage trees on the site with this application. All existing heritage trees will be preserved and specified uh, in the Arborist and Tree Protection Plan. Uh, the two trees referenced in the application for removal were actually removed in, in 2018. These two trees were removed with city arbors permit and approval on only after required public notice and completion. One bay was unhealthy and one smaller oak was removed for public safety. All fees were paid and a $300 donation was made to the planting fund. Um, no, absolutely no heritage trees were removed because of this planning commission approval. The grading in 2012, the previous neighbor at uh, 32, uh, 232 Carbonero legally graded about 3,000 acres of land on 238 Carbonero to install a competition bike ramp without a grading permit or permission. The city issued a citation. This required him only to do erosion control and did not require him to retain the property to its natural slope as shown in uh, slope survey uh, uh, 2B. The natural slope had to be recreated by the engineers and surveys in a forensic top topo map to show the grading concerns referenced in the neighbor's letter to the planning commission today was not the natural slope of the property and, and the 50% the slopes did not exist prior to the illegal grading done by others as shown in uh, attachment 2C. Um, the house plans for 238 Carbonier include grading plans that address and mitigates any potential negative grading issues and every effort and expense has been made to create a natural setting and a home that the neighbors will be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to the commission on this item? There are not. Okay, uh, hearing no one, I'll bring it back to the commission. Um, for discussion, would any commissioners want to discuss, um, have anything to say about this item? Uh, Commissioner Dawson, you want to lead off? Yeah, um, thank, thank you for the applicant for being here um, and his efforts so far in moving this project forward. Um, I did want to speak to having some concerns about using a categorical categorical exemption for this project. In my day job, I help builders stay in compliance with um, water quality regulatory requirements, and part of that is uh, developing and implementing stormwater prevention, uh, pollution prevention plans. A big part of that is erosion. And I've also been um, an ecologist for California State Parks. So I brought some of that experience when I went up to the site and, and, and looked, and I do have some concerns. Um, I think there are unusual circumstances and potentially significant impacts for this project, um, environmental impacts, and um, I think that it's important that it get a full review. And I think it makes uh, those concerns um, make it uh, ineligible for the categorical exemption. Exemption. Um, as far as the looking at the forensic grading report, as staff just mentioned, um, even if you go back with that reconstructed um, slope, 
it's it, there is going to be construction on 30 to 50 percent that's why they're applying for the slope variant um, and best practices when there is a variant for existing regulations is to have the fullest extent of review and uh, the staff report itself actually calls out this project as having unusual circumstances but really my primary concern and i'm going to bring up a slide to share with everyone here um, is related to the environmental components. Um, if you look at the slide, um, is everybody able to see this slide? I can see it. Yes. Okay, great. Um, if you look kind of in middle right, kind of just to the left of De La Viega part, there's an icon there with a little white dot. That indicates 238 Carbonara. And what we're looking at um, is the United States Fish and Wildlife uh, service critical habitat. And so, um, Zianti bandit, bandwing grasshopper, Santa Cruz tar plant, marble merlet, and robust spine flower, these are all within a mile of the project designated critical habitat. So, I, I believe this is, this supplies sig significant substantial evidence that, you know, there could be a likelihood that some one of these critters may or plants may have moved into the area and so i'm really interested in um having this have a biotic survey um so we can just make sure that um th this development is going to um, not have any unintended consequences um, for the environmental habitat so um i i don't I believe that the staff report has not provided substantial evidence that this project should receive a categorical exemption. Uh, I feel like there's substantial evidence actually that there are unusual circumstances as called out by the staff in the report. Um, and I, I just want to make sure that this goes through the normal environmental review process and that there's a biotic set study and based on those they, data um, goes through the normal process, uh, whatever may be found there. So at some point, I'd like to make a motion in that direction, but I think I could hold off making my motion until we hear from other commissioners. Um, oh, go ahead. So uh, Commissioner Spillman, did you have your hand up as well? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that information. Um, yeah, I, I think the project is, given the, the site constraints, uh, of, of the project has been done in a sensitive way. I think I've been convinced that um, we don't have a CEQA issue as it relates to the slopes on this project. And given the minor cut and fill um, disturbance of that existing soil, I'm pretty confident that there's not going to be that much disturbance out there. I don't have uh, knowledge of the uh, habitats that, that you mentioned. Um, and I do believe there was a full-blown study done back in 1979 when the subdivision was created. So I'm curious if your opinion would be that since that time, the habitat would have changed significantly to, to warrant further review. Um, that's pretty much what I have to say. I think it's um, a very similarly designed home to what's in the neighborhood, and I would support the development of the, the, the project. Thank you. Other commissioners would like to, any comments? I, um, the comments I would yeah. like to make has uh, to do with the, the the vegetation on the site. I understand what staff is saying in terms of previous studies and um, the, the fact that the, there is no mapped special status species. Um, but from my point of view, there are two justifications for doing a biotic study. One is that the site is adjacent to a large parcel of open space land that's uh, the city owns that's in, uh, that's in its natural state, and the, the use of this property, the development of this property could affect the city's open space. 
But what seems even more significant to me when I went out to look at the site was that this site is, seems to be the only site nearby that has redwood trees on it. And so it seems to me what we have are two vegetative types um, right adjacent to each other, which often leads to you know, different kinds of biotic uh, responses. So I think <clears throat> just to, to be on the safe side that there aren't any negative environmental effects uh, to biological resources, I would support doing a biotic study. So any other commissioners? Uh, uh, Commissioner Nielsen, you had your, your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm just, I have a question, I guess, maybe for staff, um, in terms of what the normal review process is on this. Um, so if it's not, if the, if the site is not in a mapped area, is, the, um, is therefore a biotic study not required? Uh, that's for typical process, yes. Okay, so that is the normal review process. That's correct. Okay. Okay, thank you. If I might add to um, what Ms. Stanger said, um, the sensitivity maps that we currently have in our general plan are based on what I would consider to be very robust um, biotic analysis that occurred um, as part of the EIR that was prepared for the general plan. So um, there, there was a lot of background studies reviewed in, in defining and mapping those sensitive areas. I'll also state that um, upon receipt of the correspondence from one of the neighbors uh, that expressed concern with um, the potential for the Zyani band wing grasshopper and the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat being present on the site, um, both Ms. Stanger and I did um, some, some background research, and um, it, it appeared that those two uh, particular species um, also depended on a soil substrate, and, and the area that they were focused in was out in the area between Scotts Valley and Felton, where there's, there's a high concentration of sand. So, um, you know, from time to time, even though a report's not um, required because of mapping, if someone from the public um, uh, alleges something, we, we do look into it, and we did in this case, and we, we just didn't find any reason to require a biotic study. Commissioner Dawson? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, to respond to a few things. Um, first, uh, Commissioner Spellman asked a question about um, the comprehensive study that when the subdivision was originally made in 1979. Um, we all know that there are well-documented changes in our environment due to climate change impacts. Um, and, and one of the ways that's affecting both plants and animals um, is the fluctuations in temp temperatures and the extremities and how long those extremities last has changed significantly over that time. So there is the potential that maybe that wasn't great habitat for these plants and animals in 1979 and certainly could be appropriate habitat now. It's a highly uh, vegetated site. Um, I went up there. It's a beautiful spot, um, but um, there's a lot going on. And as uh, Chair Schifrin mentioned, and it abuts 14 acres of, of additional land. Um, and also, I would say that um, how surveys for critical habitat is done um, is like a lot of science is done. Um, things are gridded out and then Things are, uh, they're randomly selected um, based on um, constraints for appropriate habitat for that species. So every single location that the species could possibly be in is not surveyed to make critical habitat maps. Um, and so um, one of the things uh, with that redwood stand, one of the species that I'm most interested to ensure isn't using that site is a marble murelet because there are nests quite close and other stands of redwood. Um, and it's kind of prime habitat um, for that species on, on there. So, again, um, I think I agree with what other commissioners have said um, about um, addressing some of the other issues, um, but just having a biotic study to ensure that there aren't impacts and there aren't any special status species, um, I don't think would 
would necessarily hold up the project, but it would ensure there would be any mitigation if there needed to be, and if not, um, it could go along at pace. Thank you. Uh, Conway? You have to unmute yourself. There we go. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so thanks for the information. Um, we have staff saying that um, this project meets the standard and there's been adequate review. Um, there's been a suggestion that additional review beyond that may be appropriate. I am wondering what is the impact to the project um, to do this, uh, these additional testing? I, I realize that there's some question, are they necessary? One does want to err on the side of um, protection if it's, um, you know, if it's a benefit. What's the cost? to um, both the project and to the timeline, and is it a reasonable thing to um, require an additional uh, test to, I think the applicant said that there were 17 studies and um, tests that were attached. So I guess that's, that's my question. Um, is, this a, is this a reasonable additional request? Um, I guess I'd ask Mr. Marlett. Reason is often in the eye of the beholder, but uh, yeah, I think the first thing that Marla, would you like to? You've been asked a question. Would you like to provide your response? Yeah, the, the first part of the question um, was about um, what kind of impact it would be on the timing of the project. It, it's, it's probably going to be a, a, a few months delayed. It, the applicant would need to go out and. Um, retain a biologist um, on our list of approved consultants, um, get somebody who's available, get them out to the site within their time frame and have the analysis done. Um, and then, of course, we need to schedule it for a hearing. So um, I'd say two to three months uh, minimum would be the, the impact on that. Okay. Um, is the risk... Uh commensurate with that, I mean, I, I guess there's going to be a difference of opinion about that, whether or not we're convinced by the potential of, particularly it was the, um, the Merlet that I think you were most interested in. I mean, I'm, I'm satisfied as to the environment of this, you know, the spine, cyan banded beetle. Um, Grasshopper. Up in the <laughs> grasshopper, I'm sorry. Uh, up in the sand hills. Pretty different environment. Well, I would I would just say that um, what I'm contending here is that um, this does not meet the standard for categorical exemption. I think it, it is an unusual circumstance um, mm -hmm. given the habitat that is exists. So that that's the that's the point and the argument I'm trying to make. And perhaps, um, I mean, uh, if there's additional discussion, um, it's up to the chair, or if uh, we're ready to call the question, then I can make my motion and we can see where we're at. <laughs> well, I'm um, about to ask you to make your motion. Um, uh, Commissioner Nielsen had something he wanted to say, and then there's something I want to say. So why don't you go first, Commissioner Nielsen? Oh, okay. This, uh, so this question is for Commissioner Dawson. Um, in terms of, I mean, is there something? I mean, is it possible to point to something very specific that you're looking for within this biotic report? And the reason why I ask is, if the bio, bio, biotic report is done and nothing is that that particular thing is not found to be there, is it possible that we could approve this project with the condition? that that report is done and if that is not found to be that they don't have to then they don't have to come back to the commission in the event that that the report doesn't find what it is you're looking for is that would that be an option well let, let me before uh sort of 
get my two cents worth in because it's related to what you're asking. It seems to me that two points. One, the mapping that occurs as part of the general plan and um, these sort of wide-ranging areas, I don't think they're necessarily meant to be site-specific. I know the county has all sorts of overlays for different uh, environmental resources, but on particular sites, the question is asked, are there, are there some peculiar uh, aspects of the site that may make it worth taking a, a, a closer look than what was coming through in the, in the general studies or the general mapping? And I think what seems to me that to be peculiar about this site is having these, this grove of redwood trees adjacent to uh, the you know the the other vegetation that's in the whole area, so my sense is that that's what um, you know that's from my perspective that's a, that's what I would like a biologist to take a look at to see if in fact there are any special status species out there or habitat for species that would need to be protected as part of any development on the site um, and um, it's not I'm not there's no particular species that I'm concerned about. It's just that these are different habitats. Um, they're different uh, biotic communities oftentimes. And in those situations, there can be different species that, that you don't normally find in one of those areas. So um, from my perspective, it, it makes sense to do the, bio, to do the biotic study to, the, uh, to see if there are any special status species that need protection. So in terms of your, I mean, I'll defer to uh, Commissioner uh, Dawson, but in terms of your suggestion that could we approve it uh, conditioned on a biotic study being done and uh, should any uh, potentially bio significant biotic impacts as a result of this project be identified that it would return to the, uh, that would return to the commission. Um, uh, but on the other hand, you know, I, uh, I think it might be best to have, particularly since we do have uh, at least one commissioner with a background in this area, to have that study reviewed by the commission itself would be reasonable. So that's my view of why I think we really need to have a biotic study. Commissioner Dawson, do you have anything to add? And then I would ask you to make your motion. Oh, sorry. No. Oh, I'm, go ahead. Commissioner Conway, um, you had your hand up. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to um, interrupt there. I guess I'd just like to um, say in particular, um, there is a reason for mapping and there is a reason to, you know, look further. And I feel like this part of a question of fairness, um, I mean, those the search for studies is really intended to be driven by, you know, where do we need to look more carefully? And I understand the argument that, that you're making is that there might be, it's a beautiful site, it's a special site, and you have a feeling that there could be, that we might find something. But I feel uncomfortable just on, as a fairness point to um, open up and add layers of review um, without more evidence than that. So I guess I have to say um, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not convinced about additional study. Um, that's my point. Let me just respond because I think um, what you are, I agree with the first part of what you were saying, but not the second. My concern is not that this is a beautiful site. It's that there are unusual circumstances by having these two different types of vegetation. If, I sort of looked around the neighborhood, and these were the only redwood trees I could see. And having redwood trees adjacent to the, this sort of more normal vegetation just seemed to me to, uh, in those kinds of situations, I think oftentimes there are different species than are generally in the area, and it would be worth a look to see if that's the case. So it's not a question of this is a beautiful site, so let's uh, 
um, you know, make the make the applicant spend more money. It's a question of there do seem to be some um, big, you know, biotic differences between what's going on in this site and what's going on in the general area, and it just seems uh, reasonable to ask that that be looked at in order to uh, determine whether, in fact, are any special stat status species uh, that are existing in this. Uh, this, what I think is an uh, is an unusual part, at least for this neighborhood. So, Commissioner Dawson, I'm sorry I held you up, but do you want to say anything else or make a motion? Yeah, I just want to just kind of sum up and say that I, I'm making a science-based argument. It is a fact that redwood trees about that far from the ocean are habitat for nesting murelets. Um, it's a fact that some of the vegetation there um, and the area and the exposure to sunlight um, make it appropriate for some of these special status species plants. So my argument um, and my point of un unusual circumstances is that this, these two vegetative communities that are there um, provide appropriate habitat, and it would just be good for us to have an abundance of caution, ensure um, what the status of, of, if there is any of these special status species, and then go from there. So I am going to go ahead and move that 238 Carbonara be continued, and that a biotic study be prepared, and that the project not receive a categorical exemption, but go through the normal CEQA review process. Is there a second? I'll second that. Um, could I, if, I have, have a, if I can ask a point of clarification on, on that motion? Um, if so, hypothetically, if the biotic study uh, gets prepared and the conclusion is that there are no sensitive species on the site, um, I don't see why there would be a need to do any more environmental review beyond that on the categorical exemption. Yeah, thank you. I was going to ask her whether the maker of the motion would be willing to, given the importance of the biotic issues in terms of the categorical exemption decision, whether at this time you'd be willing to amend your motion to just uh, continue the item for a biotic study that would uh, then return with the item to the commission and hold off a decision on the uh, categorical exemption until we know the results of that study. Would that be acceptable to you? Yeah, that's fair. So I, I, I move to amend that motion uh, so that... You amend it to ensure the maker. Or well, if you agree to just have continue oh, okay. the biotic study and have it returned to the commission, that's sufficient. Okay, yes, I agree to that. Okay, uh, is it further discussion on the motion? So there's a motion on the floor to continue uh, 238 Carbonara Drive for a biotic study to return to the commission for consideration. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Conway? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Maxwell? Nielsen? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Schifrin? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, 600 Entenal Street. Could we have a staff report, please? Yeah. So, um, 600 Dental Street is located um, on the hillside above the Harvey West neighborhood. Um, it's adjacent to the program of open space to the north and the west, um, and adjacent to office and industrial uses to the south. Um, the site is accessed from Ensignal Street via a 50-foot wide easement that um, straddles the two properties to the south 
and it enters the site at the um, southeast corner of the site. So here's a more close-up of the existing site. Um, it's 13.5 acres in size. The zoning is RF2A, <clears throat> which is residential suburban zoning um, with a minimum lot size of two acres. The general city designation is very low density residential, which accommodates single family residences on larger rural lots. Um, the site is currently developed with three houses, which I've identified with these yellow stars. Um, and there's also a number of natural features on the site. Um, so first, there is quite a bit of slope um, that exceeds 30%. Um, the slope survey was done by IFRM engineers. And you can see the areas of 30% are going to be engaged. The 30% slope cannot count toward the minimum lot size um, when creating a new lot. And in addition, um, building envelopes on the new lot must be at least 20 feet away from any 30% slope. So there's also a creek. Um, Pogano Creek runs along the north side of the property, right along the property line pretty much. Um, and you can see the creek setback area in blue. Um, there are some previously unpermitted structures, um, a dirt driveway and some other debris that um, has been partially resolved as part of a code violation under a previous owner. Um, a condition of approval requires the applicant to obtain a water course development permit to complete the rehabilitation of the creek setback consistent with the city wide creeks and wetlands management plan um, and prior to refurbation of the central map. There's also some different habitat site, um, types on the property. Um, so in the uh, purple down by the creek, um, we have riparian woodland. Um, there's also a redwood grove and it's right here in the north part of the site. And then down on the southern part, we have coastal prairie habitat and needle grass grassland habitat. Now, there's also quite a few heritage sized trees on the site. And the trees are identified on this map. Um, you can kind of see the tiny little dots with the numbers. Um, and those are all the trees. Um, so the proposal is to demolish one of the three dwellings and to divide the site into four new parcels. Um, and that will result in two parcels that um, retain, um, that each retain one of the two remaining dwellings, and then two parcels um, that will be vacant um, buildable lots. So here's the proposed site layout. Um, here's lot one over on the west side of the lot. Um, lot two is to the south here. Lot three is kind of squished in the middle, and then lot four is up on the east and north side of the site. Each of these parcels meet the minimum size of two acres that are required by um, the zone district. Um, and again, this lot size excludes areas of 30% or greater slope. Um, the building envelopes, which you can see in the dashed lines, are um, all 20 feet away from the 30% slope, so they also meet the um, required setbacks for the zone district. Um, an artwork report was also prepared for this project. Um, and as a result of the artwork support um, and uh, some recommendations from the city artwork, these um, building envelopes have been modified to their current configuration. Um, to um, create buffers from any um, healthy heritage trees that should be retained um, during development of the site. And again, there's no street access to the site. Um, it's through that easement that's down at the south end of the site. Um, so the proposal would need approval um, from the Planning Commission um, for a variation to lot standards to exempt these new parcels um, from requiring street frontage, um, just as the existing parcels already doesn't have the street frontage. Um, 
the access to the new parcels is going to be via a of the easement and then a shared driveway that goes across lots one and two um, and then an existing driveway that will go across lot three and four. Uh, conditions of approval require easements for these driveways and utility lines um, that will be running under the driveways um, to be included in the legal property description for the new parcels. So here is a close up at the proposed new driveway for lots one and two. It cuts through about 162 square feet of land that has slope 60 and 30 percent in slope. That's shown in the little, tiny little green areas that you can see on the screen here. Uh, the slope variance is required for driveways that encroach on or cut through a 30 percent or greater slope. Um, to meet the findings for the slope variance, the project must show that there is a hardship peculiar to the property that the variance is needed to exercise substantial property rights and that the proposal conforms to the topography and provides open space as much as possible. So in this case, um, the steep slope on the site create a unique situation on the property um, where it's really not possible to construct a driveway without, I mean, this is about as good as they could get without cutting into the slope a tiny bit. But, um, Access to lots one and two is a substantial property right. You need to be able to access your lot um, if you own a lot, and the driveway provides that access. Um, the driveway is also required in order to meet fire access requirements, um, and they require a fire access road with a slope no greater than 20%. Uh, the grading for this driveway will need to cut through some corners of the existing 30% slope um, in order to um, in order to keep the actual slope of the driveway at 20% or less. Um, in addition, the proposed driveway location conforms to the existing site topography as much as possible. Um, and the driveway is supposed to be only 12 feet wide, which is the minimum required for the driveway. So that really minimizes um, the amount of grading needed within the 30% slope um, and the amount of disturbance of the open space. Um, the proposed driveway has also been designed by a registered civil engineer um, with F1 engineers um, and a geotechnical evaluation was completed by um, Howard Kucinich and Associates. The, um, that review recommended actions related to um, grading and erosion control and those recommendations are included as conditions of approval. So here's a profile of the proposed new driveway. As you can see, there's a very minimal amount of grading. Um, the solid line is the proposed driveway, and the dashed line is the existing grade. So for the most part, it really conforms with the site topography. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the houses on the site. Um, so the applicant proposes to demolish one of the houses, um, which is going to be on lot three. Um, and that house is shown on the bottom left corner of the screen. This house was originally constructed in the late 1950s without a permit. Um, and it is part trailer and part wood frame construction. There was a code compliance case on the site um, that resulted in legalization of this house. Um, review of the house found that there are no eligible tenants that would be uh, eligible for relocation assistance. Um, and um, staff review found that the house doesn't have any historical qualities um, that would want a historical review. So the findings for a residential demolition authorization permit to demolish this house can be met. Um, the condition of approval requires this house to be demolished before the parcel map is reported um, in order to ensure that there is only one house on the resulting um, site when the map is recorded. On the new parcel. So um, the project entitlements also include a minor modification um, to retain the house on lot four, which you can see on the upper right corner of the screen. This is actually the original house on the site that was constructed uh, maybe in the late 1800s or early 1900s. Um, a condition of approval for the second house on the site which was approved in the late 1950s, 
required that the first house be demolished. However, the first house was never demolished. Uh, this house is in good shape, um, and there's no need to demolish the house at this point since it will be on its own lot. So for environmental review, um, an initial study and a mitigated negative declaration were prepared for this project. Um, there were potential significant impacts found um, related to biotic and geologic resources. Um, the big one is the impact to the coastal prairie and needle grass grassland habitat. As you can see on the screen, um, the coastal prairie is in the purple, and then the needle grass grassland is in blue. And you can see that the driveway cuts through part of the needle grass grassland, and then um, the two building envelopes for lots one and two cut into the coastal prairie habitat. Um, so the general plan does not prohibit development on sensitive habitat areas. Um, however, it does require mitigation as part of the environmental review process for the project. Uh, so this project proposes mitigation um, at a four to one ratio um, of habitat that has been disturbed. The mitigation area is shown um, in the, the shaded dotted area on the plan. Um, and uh, a mitigation measure in the mitigated negative declaration requires implementation of a mitigation management and monitoring plan for, um, for this mitigation area. Um, other mitigation measures in that document include those to protect bats and birds um, and also to prevent erosion during construction of the road or the, uh, the driver's walk on the roof. Um, there was a public review period for the mitigated negative declaration that ran from March 30th through April 28th. Um, the city did not receive any comments from the public or any other government agency during this time. So in conclusion, staff recommends that the Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination of the mitigated negative declaration and approve the project with the recommended conditions. Um, this concludes my presentation and I'm available to answer any questions. Sorry. Um, do, any, do any of the commissioners have questions? Is there anybody from the public who's here to um, testify? I don't see anyone raising their hands, Chair. Oh, wait, there's one. <laughs> okay, please um, announce yourself and um, you have three minutes to testify. Welcome. Hi, this is Eric Barbic. I am a um, member of Coastal Asset Holdings LLC, which is the applicant here. Uh, I won't waste three minutes of everybody's time. Um, just wanted to thank staff. This has been a long, arduous process on this property with all the constraints and challenges that we've faced and tried to keep it uh, the property in its natural state as much as possible. Um, so here to answer any questions, if there's anything that we can help assist in helping educate you guys on it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commission. Let me just say before I ask for uh, discussion that I had some concerns at the beginning when I first, actually with the mitigated negative declaration, uh, and then with the staff report, and uh, I want to thank staff and the applicant for giving me a tour of the property so I could actually see what was uh, proposed because there really wasn't much visibility of the, um, of the site from outside of the property. So um, my major concern was the proposed houses would be visible from Poganip, but having gone out to the site and looked at the vegetation, I don't think that's going to be the case, and uh, I, I do recommend, I, I, as I remember, the 
Uh, houses will need design permits, and they will be very visible from Harvey, Harvey West. So I think that, you know, I would expect that the uh, plans would do what they can to blend into the hill, but <coughs> into the hillside, but I uh, and the landscape. But I don't have any objections to this, and uh, feel supportive of the staff recommendation. Are there any other commissioner comments? Seeing, one, seeing none, would somebody like to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation? Commissioner Spellman, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, obviously, this is a very unusual site, lots of challenges. I sort of see this, uh, what I would consider minor development as a win-win for the city uh, from a public safety standpoint, to be able to get fire trucks back into that area that um, has been impacted in the recent past with, with fire uh, scenarios going on. Um, we know that the area off of Golf Club Drive, just on the other side of the creek, is limited in its access from the fire department because of the low trestle there. So if and when something happens, there's still going to be significantly limited access. So I think it's trying to take a very challenging site and I think ending up with a, a positive uh, solution for everyone. So I'm, I'm in support of the project. Would you like to make a motion or somebody like to make a motion to approve the staff Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the staff recommendation. Is there a second? I'll go ahead and second that. Okay, um, a motion by Commissioner Spellman, seconded by Commissioner Maxwell. Any further discussion? Do we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Conway? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Schifrin? Aye. Passage unanimously. We'll now move on to um, item number five, nine fourteen, nine sixteen. Seabright. Um, can we have a staff report, please? Hi everyone, good evening. Can you all hear me? I can. Yes, good evening. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm excited to bring this project back. Um, as you might recall, this is a project that was heard by the Planning Commission on May 16th of last year. Um, it was continued by the Planning Commission for a redesign to reduce the building massing and to um, also stay within the density range and if possible to provide a diversity of housing types um, the Planning Commission noted that uh, consideration of the application of a density bonus shall not be precluded in this project. Um, the project previously proposed and continues to propose the demolition of three existing residences and the construction of a nine-unit townhouse development at the parcel known as 914 and 916 Seabright Avenue. Um, the project as revised uh, continue to require approval of a residential demolition authorization permit, a tentative map, a design and a design permit. Um, however, this revised project also includes a request for a density bonus waiver to the open space requirements. This is the project site. It's located on Seabright Avenue, um, has access from Seabright Avenue and from the cul-de-sac at the terminus of Sumner. Uh, the parcel is not within the boundaries of the Seabright Area Plan, and it's within Exclusion Area A of the Coastal Zone um, and is eligible for a Coastal Permit Exclusion. The Site Zone RL, which is a multifamily low-density district, and it's surrounded by other parcels that are also in the RL Zone District. This is just an aerial photo of the property showing um, the existing development there are uh, 
two, there's a duplex unit at the front that consists of two one bedroom units that face Seabright. And then towards the rear, there's a two bedroom cottage. There's also various fruit trees on the property, um, but no trees that would qualify as heritage trees. Um, here's a photo of the existing duplex facing Seabright. It's panoramic view showing the properties to the north and south. Um, and then this is another photo of the property to the north. And then this is the um, view of the project site from Sumner Avenue um, to the right. That's a, a newer ADU that was constructed and then a single family residence on the left. Um, and then this is just a view of the project site um, and the trees that are there and then the cottages further up. I just want to go through some slides showing the original uh, development that came in and then the proposed development before you tonight. Uh, the project originally proposed nine attached three-story, three-bedroom townhouse units. The applicant went to great lengths to, great lengths to address building massing. Um, and so he's now proposing nine two-story units um, and has reduced two of the units to two bedroom units and revised the parking to a tandem arrangement to allow for a break in the building um, where a 24 inch box size pink crepe myrtle will be planted. So I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the break is here in the middle. Um, the pedestrian path is still provided through the parcel and the planning department continues to recommend that this pathway be made open to the public to provide connectivity between the neighborhoods to increase coastal access and to encourage walking and biking as an alternative form of transportation. Because the pathway uh, will continue to be located on private property and not within a public access easement or a public right of way, the building department determined that the accessibility requirements shown in the original proposal are not required. Um, the access point at Sumner continues to be gated and would only be accessible by emergency vehicles and uh, sanitation trucks. Um, here's a comparison of the north elevation. Uh, additional changes were made to allow for greater compatibility with the existing surrounding neighborhood and also to assist in reducing the building mass. These uh, wide dormers that were originally proposed are uh, replaced with front-facing gables and the exterior materials are now differentiated between units to provide some individuality rather than the appearance of one big building. Um, South Elevation had similar updates, uh, providing individual balconies to break up the long building wall, and then, of course, the height difference between the two. And this is a building section that shows the building in relation to the um, existing buildings to the north and the south um, along Seabright. That dashed black line there identifies the originally proposed three-story height the new proposed two-story structure is a compatible size with the two adjacent, adjacent units and other two and three-story residences in the surrounding area. So this image also shows the um, height difference that they're proposing. That red dash line shows the 30-foot height limit uh, measured to the midpoint of the roof line on the original proposal and measured to the roof peak on the um, the project that's before you today. The applicant also submitted a revised shadow study. Um, this was based on the revised height of the development. The shadow study looks at impacts during the morning and afternoon of the summer and winter solstices and shows that there are <coughs> limited impacts on property to the north. Um, we expect some shading impacts to occur with an urban infill project, but this proposal limits these to the greatest extent possible. It locates the development at the south side of the property um, and provides a 20-foot setback to the north property line. Um, and then the reduction in building height also reduces shading impacts on the north adjacent properties. Um, let's see, these are some of the renderings that were submitted. This is uh, the rendering um, showing the view of the development from Seabright Avenue. And then a rendering of the development from the Sumner cul-de-sac. So as part of this project, the applicant's requesting the density bonus waiver of the open space requirements. Uh, the project is deemed complete prior to the adoption of the current inclusionary ordinance that requires 20% um, 
of the project to be provided as, um, excuse me for a minute. my computer to die. <laughs> um, yeah, so this was, um, this project is subject to the prior inclusionary ordinance that requires 15% of the total units in the development to be maintained as inclusionary units. Um, and this, and that's at 80% area median income. For this project, that's equal to 1.35. So they'll be required to provide one unit and then they can put, pay an in lieu fee for the fractional amount. In order to be eligible for the density bonus, the project must provide a deeper level of affordability, uh, providing 10% of the total units as affordable to lower income households at 60% AMI. The applicant is level of affordability and is therefore also eligible to provide two additional market rate units as density bonus units pursuant to the city's density bonus ordinance and the state law. The applicant is not proposing to construct the additional units. However, the applicant is requesting approval of a density bonus waiver to the open space requirements. The uh, requested waiver would allow for the rear yard areas to be counted as open space, even though they have dimensions of less than 10 feet. It would also allow for an approximately 20% reduction in the total open space requirement and would um, allow for units four and nine to provide 70 square feet of private open space for a house per unit is required. In order to be eligible for the density bonus waiver, the applicant needs to show that the full application of the open space requirements would physically preclude the construction of the project with the density bonus unit. The project as proposed complies with all other requirements imposed by other city departments, such as the building department and the fire department. Um, the applicant has also reduced the sizes of the units significantly to meet the design preferences of the planning commission um, and provides, provides unit amenities such as appropriate sized living areas. A full implementation of the open space requirements would further reduce living area within the units and would require the development to encroach north into the minimum width driveway as required by the fire department. Um, and this is all without providing the two additional units that they're entitled to. Um, <clears throat> we obtained the advice of the city attorney because there's very little direction regarding the definition of uh, physically precludes. The city attorney's memo is attached to a report. It indicates that features such as ceiling height are considered to be amenities that are not intended to be stripped of a development that would provide affordable housing under the density bonus ordinance. The minimal living area proposed within the units is consistent with this inter interpretation of amenity space. Therefore, the applicant has shown that the full application of the open space requirements physically precludes the construction of the project and a waiver of the open space requirements is recommended. Sure. Um, and it's one last thing. Um, the project includes the demolition of two one-bedroom units and one two-bedroom unit, um, <coughs> and those are passed by low to moderate income households. So um, under the city's replacement housing requirement, the property owner is required to replace 50% of the bedrooms to be demolished. The replacement unit must remain an affordable rental unit in perpetuity. The property owner wishes to maintain ownership of all the units and rent them out. Um, and during this rental period, the code allows for the replacement unit and the inclusionary unit to be provided as one unit, a three bedroom unit in this case, which is a representative of the unit mix, of the majority of the unit mix, I should say. Um, this unit would be provided at the most restrictive income and rent requirements, which in this case would be the 60% AMI required by the density bonus. At the time when the first unit is sold, the inclusionary unit must also be made for sale, um, available for sale. Um, however, the replacement unit will be required to be maintained as an affordable rental unit in perpetuity. Um, so with this project, we're getting the um, payment of a fractional and loofy, uh, one affordable unit provided at the most restricted level of affordability required by the density bonus ordinance. Um, and then when the first unit sold, we're getting a for sale affordable unit as well as um, an affordable rental unit. 
This project meets all of the city's objective general plan and zoning standards with the exception of the density bonus waiver to open space and the Housing Accountability Act. That's not considered to constitute inconsistency or nonconformity. The project maximizes infill development on a parcel that's zoned for multifamily residential uses and provides a pedestrian uh, public pedestrian connection between neighborhoods consistent with several general plan policies and objectives. Um, and the project has been significantly redesigned to meet the preferences of the planning commission and the neighbors. Um, I did receive public comments on this project and those have been provided to you and attached to the staff report. Um, it's uh, recommended that the planning commission recommend to the city council to approve the project as proposed based on the findings in the attached draft resolution and the conditions of approval in exhibit A. Thank you very much. The way, uh, are there people in the, uh, uh, who've called in who want to testify on this? I don't, I want, I don't want them to start yet. I just want to know how many people are wanting to testify. Um, Chair, this is the clerk. I see that um, the applicant has raised uh, his hand as well as a member of the public. So why don't we start first with questions from uh, commissioners. Any questions on um, the staff report in this project? Yes, um, Commissioner Conway. I just have a question about the way the um, affordable housing is provided. I don't think I've seen before, we've certainly seen plenty of projects that are mapped that are, rent, are intended to be rented for a period of time. But I don't know that we've seen it before um, where one of the affordable units was going to continue to be rented. Um, and I, I think it's actually a pretty good solution to getting some deeper affordability or at least potentially a good solution. I wonder if there's any question about ongoing management um, of that unit in the future. So when the rest of the units sell, that one is going to continue to be held, you know, by whom and what's the management plan? Um, we haven't received any formal statement about how they're going to manage that unit from the applicant, but um, it's possible mm -hmm. that they could um, handle that um, will probably require that a management company is responsible for it. Um, it's also possible that potentially one of the owners could um, buy that unit and be responsible for the, the continued rent uh, rental status mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Does the city uh, certify the eligibility uh, of the occupant? Uh, I know they do. A, I'm, I, I'm not exactly sure how they do it. Um, or, is that, but, or is that good? Uh, well, both of the units would be covered under a um, affordable housing participation agreement. So um, I would assume it would get into that level of detail. Okay. Thanks. That was Other my question? question. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one has to do with uh, the access from Sumner. Um, it sounded from the staff report as if there, what was being proposed was only emergency vehicle access and not ped uh, pedestrian access that was available all the time. Could you clarify that, please? Yes, um, vehicular access would only be allowed for emergency vehicles and um, sanitation trucks, but we do have a condition in the report that we're recommending that would allow for public to access the pedestrian walkway to have through access. So the pedestrian walkway would remain open to the public, but the vehicular access would be closed to the public. Okay, that's what I thought, but clear in the presentation. Then I had asked um, staff to uh, put on the um, replacement housing ordinance because I, I have a concern um, due to the fact that we're ending up um, losing three affordable units and for an uncertain period of time only getting one affordable unit. So I uh, would like, if, if you can, to put on the replacement housing uh, ordinance 
and ask that um, the commission look at uh, Section 1B, because what that says, and this is under the, the requirement that uh, affordable housing uh, demolished be replaced, uh, the bedrooms be, half of the bedrooms be replaced, and it says inclusionary rental units located on the site may also be counted as replacement units. Um, and to my mind, that gives the city discretion to um, require that they not be counted as inclusionary units. And it made me think about, well, under what conditions would they, uh, would it make sense to, for the city to not allow the replacement housing units to be counted as inclusionary units? I think generally I have concerns about that, but I particularly have concerns um, when what, what the project would do is reduce the number of affordable units uh, in, the, in the community. So I wanted to bring that to the attention of the uh, commission that, uh, and just check with staff that my, and which is why it's still a question, why, if my understanding is correct, that the city, the, the commission can recommend and the council can require that from the beginning there be two affordable units uh, as part of this project, uh, a replacement affordable unit and an inclusionary unit. Is my understanding correct? Um, the code does say, um, it does use the word may. It doesn't say shall or um, should. It just says may. Um, so um, my understanding is that, the, you know, it is a, the discretion of the planning commission to allow it to be counted as a replacement unit and an inclusionary unit. Um, I think that the applicant um, would probably like to address the um, amount of effort that they've put into addressing the um, design preferences of the Planning Commission and the impact of those uh, design revisions on the sizes of the units that were proposed and how that's affected project from a feasibility standpoint. So we might want to hear from the applicant on that as well. I'm sure we'll definitely hear from the applicant on that and anything else that he wants to tell us about. I just wanted to clarify that point, what the discretion of the com uh, commission was in, re in responding to the staff recommendation. Uh, okay, are there, I don't think I had any other questions at this time. Are there other commissioners with questions? Okay, I'm going to open up the uh, public hearing, and we'll first hear from the applicant. Um, oh, wait, is there a question, Commissioner Greenberg? Do you have a, qu a question? Um, yeah, I just want to, and maybe this is something for the following discussion, but just to clarify um, the recommendations that the commission made originally had to do with questions of the size of the units and the diversity of the size of the units not only from a design standpoint, but I believe also from an affordability standpoint. Um, and so there is some question about, you know, with the larger size of units, that would preclude the, the possibility of a variety of um, price points for the different units. And I don't know if that's, that's part of the staff report or part of the, you know, the, the submission by the applicant. Well, maybe we'll hear from the applicant about that uh, aspect of it. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, I just had a uh, question for staff related to um, it's conditions 13 and 30 that speak about uh, having uh, acts, an easement pathway from Sumner to Seabright. Um, I know the general plan does encourage connecting transportation corridors, um, encouraging coastal access, um, but as a resident of the east side and as somebody has reviewed um, the traffic studies available, Seabright itself is actually one of the more dangerous um, roads in the city. Um, it's, I think, uh, I believe if I remember correctly, on top five for vehicle accidents as well as I think 
pedestrian accidents. And so I'm just wondering why the staff included that as a condition. Um, to require the pedestrian access through the mm -hmm. site? Yeah. Um, Seabright area, Seabright is um, fully improved. So they have sidewalks um, to keep the pedestrians off the street. Um, the end of, it connects the end of Sumner with um, Seabright Avenue, which Seabright is an arterial it provides through access to the city. So it could provide a lot of connectivity between neighbors, between neighborhoods. Um, there's also goals in the general plan that encourage um, increased coastal access and Seabright provides direct coastal access as well. Um, <clears throat> so the intent is really to meet those policies that encourage connectivity between neighborhoods. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, again, I'll open the public hearing. Let's hear from the applicant. Um, how much time are you going to need no less, no more than an hour. <laughs> All, right. All right, about three minutes. <laughs> It'll work. Uh, if that's what I've got, that's what I'll take. Um, no, you have more than that if you need it. Um, yeah. three, uh, no, I'll, I'll try and keep it short. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. A, a lot has transpired since uh, we last met. Um, we took to heart uh, the... Would you uh, introduce yourself, please? I'm sorry, Derek Van Alstyne, and we're the project designer. And I represent Jill and Jerry Houston, who are the owners. Okay, go on. So, uh, a lot has transpired since uh, we had, uh, we first submitted this a couple of years ago, um, and we took to heart uh, what we heard at the neighborhood meeting. Um, there were uh, a lot of concerns about mass and size, and I think that was reflected in the subsequent uh, planning commission meeting where uh, there was also a lot of discussion of mass and size. Uh, we were given the, um, uh, the guidance that, uh, we'd, that the commission would like to see it uh, be more diverse uh, in, in unit sizes. And, and affordability that they would like the uh, to uh, reduce the uh, the mass and uh, increase the number of units if possible by use of uh, the density bonus. Well, th this parcel really doesn't uh, like it wouldn't like to have more than nine units on it. Um, we were able to reduce the units. Uh, approximately 30%, which is a huge reduction, uh, and take one story off. So we, uh, we've, we reduced the, also uh, the building height by about 20% um, by uh, doing away with the third story. So we're now at uh, a floor area of 14,000 square feet where the previous application was for 22,000 square feet. That's a significant reduction. Um, that that means also a significant uh, reduction in the revenue stream from the rentals, but it also means that those rentals are less expensive than they would have been quite by quite a bit. So, uh, and we also uh, uh, have two additional uh, two bedroom units. Um, instead of being all three bedroom <laughs> units. So uh, quite a difference in, in the way that the building looks and feels, and we were able to separate it and get some, uh, get some airspace between it. Um, a great deal of time was spent uh, trying to address all the issues. Staff was really great in working with us to uh, get it to where we want it. Um, both, both staff and, and my staff uh, work very hard to get it to, to work properly. Um, it's a tight site. Um, I think we've got the best that it can possibly be. Um, I think that the if we were to have to do uh, another low income unit, it would it may actually tilt the scales and not make this project viable. Um, I think the, I think that the uh, 
the configuration we have now is probably the best that it can be. Um, and the, you know, the other thing that I would mention is that the walkway, uh, as, as shown, um, is something that, that a lot of neighbors did want, didn't want to have. They didn't want to have people cutting through their neighborhood. Um, th that, that came out loud and clear when we did the neighborhood meetings. Um, my client also would would not like to have the pedestrian walkway uh, cutting across the property uh, for obvious reasons. So uh, we would ask that uh, you approve this project as as submitted, and that uh, condition 13 be removed. I know that it's a it's a suggestion by the uh, in the general plan that you do that wherever you can, uh, but I think that also uh, in this case the neighbors have spoken, and uh, I, I can see uh, if I were living in those uh, in one of those units, I, I wouldn't want to have people cutting through all the time. Um, it, it just uh, it, it asks for nuisance. So uh, with that, I'll leave it, and if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the public that would like to testify on this matter? Uh, yes, Chair Schifrin and members of the commission. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to comment this evening. I understand I have three minutes. My name is Walt Wadlow and I reside at 548 Sumner Street, uh, which is on the Sumner Street cul-de-sac, uh, which will be impacted by the proposed project. Uh, there'll be two of us commenting on this phone line this evening. Uh, so when I've completed my comments, uh, if you are amenable to it, I have another individual who would like to also provide comments. Well, it is three minutes I, per person, not phone line. Understood. Thank you. Uh, I will note that I did submit written comments uh, when this item was originally scheduled as item four for the May 7th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. I will not repeat those, but I do want to highlight just a couple of things from those comments. First, I would like, I'd like to express gratitude to the city staff and the applicant for their efforts to reduce the massing. Secondly, uh, we would like to also thank the applicant and city staff for providing a locking system uh, that limits vehicular access to Sumner Street. We understand that emergency vehicles need to have that access, uh, but we appreciate uh, limiting it uh, to those. Um, three specific concerns remain. Uh, and the primary one of these is the unimpeded public pedestrian access from Seabright Avenue to Sumner Street. Uh, the agenda report justifies this on the basis of reduced walking distances to Seabright Beach for Sumner Street residents and as being in conformance with the general plan and local coast and pro coastal program policies. As somebody who lives on Sumner Street, I wanna note that that's a theoretical construct as virtually all of our neighbors and we know almost all of them, owners and renters, access the beach via Frederick Street steps to the harbor and hence to the beach rather than traveling down frequently busy Seabright Avenue. Further, the agenda report makes reference to this increased access supporting the city's new health and all policies ordinance. And I'd like to note that the new ordinance also specifically includes support for public safety in the findings. And that is the concern that I wanna to raise to you this evening. Our neighborhood already experiences petty theft uh, from vehicles parked on Sumner Street, as well as from our garages. In a discussion a couple of years ago with a Santa Cruz police officer, he noted that our neighborhood is, quote, along the route between Ocean View Park and Arana Gulch, and we're lucky we're a cul-de-sac. Additional access, which will accommodate not only pedestrians, but bicycles, could very likely increase access to and potential escape from the cul-de-sac, resulting in an increase in crime on our street. The third and final concern that I wanna raise is there are already a large number of vehicles parked at the end of the cul-de-sac, sometimes three deep from the curb. The curb cut for, for vehicular access and a proposed fire hydrant will reduce the parking even further, making even more difficult access for fire trucks to the end of Sumner Street than it currently has. I would request that the commission direct staff to consider eliminating the unimpeded access from Seabright to Sumner Street which I, is, I believe, the uh, point that was raised uh, by the applicant just a minute ago. And that concludes my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. 
<clears throat> Hello? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening, Chair Schifrin and Commissioners. My name is Allison Russell. I'm a homeowner at 548 Summer Street and would be impacted by the proposed project. I'm going to highlight comments I've made previously in emails to the Commission. Generally, I think the project is trying to force too many units into the space. I would prefer more open space also for the people who are going to live there and to better reflect the character of the neighborhood. A Seabright, while not an officially designated transportation corridor, is very busy. And the project is located between two intersections that have already been identified as problematic by the city. Seabright has frequent traffic problems and has had numerous accidents concerning pedestrians and cyclists. I'm concerned that the proposed project will exacerbate these existing problems. The project site should be able to accommodate all vehicles, including residence vehicles, visitor vehicles, trash, green waste, and recycling trucks, and emergency vehicles. With nine units, I doubt that that's possible. While I am okay with emergency vehicles occasionally using Sumner Street to exit the development, I feel strongly that all other truck and visitor traffic should be prevented from using our street, which is already overparked. Also, small children routinely play at the southern end of Sumner Street, so there's a safety issue there. Um, regarding the proposed pedestrian walkway, I am concerned that it will bring additional property crime to Sumner Street. We do not need the walkway or want it. We already walk and cycle along existing tr uh, streets. We have plenty of connectivity. We ride our bikes to the beach. We ride our bikes downtown. We walk. We do not need the walkway, and we do not want it. Please do not build the walkway. Um, the property now provides housing for three low-income households. And as I see it, Santa Cruz particularly needs affordable housing. The project should really try to keep at least two units of affordable housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public who would like to testify to, on this item? There are no other speakers, Chair. Um, would the applicant like uh, opportunity to rebut any of the testimony? I guess not. <laughs> Nothing. I would assume that uh, he doesn't. So I'll bring the I'll close the public hearing and bring the uh, matter back to the uh, commission for discussion and action. Um, who would like to uh, comment on this application? Chair sure, Schiffer, sure, just yes. a couple things. Public uh, okay. comment. Before we um, from the commission, will. From staff, okay? Staff, let us know what we need to know. The, the argument with the um, general plan policy that the pedestrian pathway um, supports was in the staff report that was originally provided to the Planning Commission. It was provided as an attachment. So um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of the number of policies that this pedestrian pathway would support. Um, and it's to provide connectivity between neighborhoods and district, also to provide a well-connected street and pedestrian network. Um, it implements the master transportation city's recommendation for improving the city's pedestrian network. Um, it would discourage through traffic by encouraging um, bicycle and pedestrian movement. Um, we also have um, uh, an active transportation plan, the objective of which is to um, create a bicycle and pedestrian network to establish a comprehensive bicycle and pedestrian transportation system that's integrated with the existing city network, um, provide a complete bicycle and pedestrian network among residential areas, complete and maintain the city sidewalk system. So um, uh, the member of the public who spoke mentioned that they take a different route down to the beach, but this connectivity would also allow folks to access some of the commercial services at the end of Seabright as well, um, and to um, um, as well as the beach. So um, this pedestrian path is important in terms of um, implementing a lot of our general plan goals. Um, 
and um, the, I believe that the condition does allow for them to close that access point in during the night time, so um, it wouldn't necessarily need to be open at all hours. Could I ask a follow-up question? Um, is the, that access uh, shown on any bike or pedestrian plan that the city has adopted? I understand what you're saying about the general plan, but the city does, I think, have some plans for bike routes and, and uh, pedestrian, uh, pedestrian paths. Is this connection shown on that, any of those? Um. Aware that it is uh, shown specifically on any plan, but whenever we find a way to provide connectivity that allows for alternative modes of transportation, um, we would recommend that we take those opportunities. Okay, thank you. Um, members of the, com I think uh, Commissioner, oh, why don't I start with Commissioner Spellman? Would you go first? Then Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, thank you. So yes, I'd like to thank SCAF and the applicant for bringing this project back to us. I think I'd like to start from the bigger picture uh, than focusing down. I do think this public access issue is an important one, obviously, to the community that surrounds this project. And it seems overwhelmingly that the, the community is against allowing that connection. Uh, and I would tend to agree with that. I do think this is sort of a, a one-off condition to the larger general plan policies that uh, Samantha is pointing out. You know, this this property currently, you know, is developed with some units in a driveway like many parcels are in that area, and then it has a very large open space in the back abutting onto the Sumner side of the property. Um, I think a lot of folks in that neighborhood are communicating, you know, there's some sense of safety in in living in a cul-de-sac uh, setup, and they sort of feel that this is an invasion of that scenario. So I think there's, I would recommend that we remove that condition from the project. Um, if we don't remove it, uh, and there's strong sense from the rest of the commission on that, I would make a suggestion that the current way that the sidewalk is drawn as it exits uh, onto Sumner, it currently goes right along the property line, which is right up against that existing accessory dwelling unit that was built. If at least that sidewalk could be moved and be contiguous with the, you know, the curb so it's closer to the actual street and you could have some small buffer between the sidewalk and the property line and that existing unit under that condition. Um, then I had, a, I had a couple questions. I was hoping it would come out in the discussion of the project. It looks, it, it, it is a very tight site. Uh, the way the parking has now changed from a, let's call it a side-by-side two-car garage. In the previous submittal, it's now a tandem setup. There's very few dimensions on the plans that were given, so it's hard to determine uh, proper backup uh, scenario from those parking spaces, as well as the actual dimensions of the parking spaces themselves. My guesstimation based on the limited dimensions that were given is that it looks to be short on uh, you know, the space needed even if I were counting one of those tandem spots as a compact parking space, it looked like it was coming up short. Um, if it is, it's a, it's a few feet. <clears throat> so I don't think I would hold up the project based on that, but it'd be interesting to see if it's up to the current standards. Um, I want to commend them for the Change in massing, yes, this is a significant reduction in what was presented before. Um, I do think there's potential to go even further. Uh, it looks like we now have a ground floor and a second floor plate height and then just an attic space above. We no longer have 
living spaces taking advantage of the, the roof space. And so I wonder if that roof massing could be reduced even further and have less of an impact on the, certainly on the neighbors to the north uh, of the project. I realize there's some um, gables and let's call it larger dormer conditions uh, that are providing the individual uh, front elevation massing for those units that has to be contended with. But from what I can see in the drawing, even there's still some potential to to reduce that uh, massing. Um, and then there were several other comments uh, from the public. Um, on the number of units on the massing, uh, some did that they felt like the minimum uh, was done. I think from my perspective, we certainly are looking for a project that is pushing the bound of uh, the allowable density on this site. So I don't think significantly reduced units is thing that would be supported. Uh, that's been a mandate that's been been given to the commission. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the gist of my comments. I mean, I think I'm in support of the current. I would encourage uh, even further sensitivity to the roof massing moving forward. I, again, I wouldn't um, not approve the project on that issue. Encourage the. Um, the project moving forward to see if that issue could be even further. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dawson, you were next. Yes, I just want to concur really strongly with what Commissioner Smellman said about um, um, I'm in support of removing conditions 13 and 30 that require the pedestrian pathway. Uh, I live in Seabright. I bike almost exclusively. Um, in fact, I biked over to the project site yesterday, and while uh, cutting down Seabright to the project, uh, there are several cars missing uh, their rearview mirror that was laying on the ground. Seabright is a very dangerous road. I avoid it at all costs, and um, even walking down it. So I, I really think there there's no need to put additional pedestrian traffic on that street people access the businesses from, from other ways um, at the end of Seabright there. And so I would strongly support removing conditions 13 and 30 when we get to that point. And then I will say that um, I'm not going to uh, belabor the point. I'll give other commissioners a chance to get into this, but I absolutely believe we should use our discretion um, to require um, the inclusionary units um, so that the replacement units um, uh, are, are, are not counted as, um, or, or I'm sorry, the inclusionary unit is not counted as uh, the replacement units so that we um, are replacing three units. We're losing three units of affordable housing and we need to replace three units, not just the bedrooms. Thanks. Other commissioners um, have any comments? Uh, Commissioner Nielsen. Um, yep. Um, I, uh, oh, am I I'm muted? Oh, yeah. Um, so I would just like to, first of all, I would like to commend um, the applicant um, for kind of all the work that was done to, um, to to get this to what it is now. I mean, I, I know it's not easy to um, to, to to cut out 30 percent of um, of the design and and still have it work and make it work. And so. Um, so I, 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 I recognize that. And I think it's, um, I, it, it, I think you did a commendable job on that. Um, I also had, um, in addition to, uh, Commissioner Spellman, I was also curious about that back out, um, distance, um, for the, for the parking. It appears to me that I think that, that it's a standard space in the garage and then maybe a compact, um, space parked tandemly, um, but even still, I think the, from the, from that, um, from the compact car, it looks like the, 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 
there's not the 24 um, foot back out distance. Um, so I'm curious about that. Um, and maybe, I don't know if maybe Samantha has um, information on that. Um, the, um, I do, I'll also, um, I, I, even though, I mean, I, I do really, I do appreciate the, the reduction of mass on the building. I think there's, I mean, I, I really, I'm really, I was really happy that Samantha showed um, kind of what was presented originally and then what is being presented now. Um, it's not just the, it's, it's not even just the building height um, that has changed, but it's also, if you look at the elevations of the building, the um, kind of the ins and outs that happen with the, with those, um, with the decks on the, on the front elevation really helps break this building up. And so I was really, I really did appreciate that. And then the, the and obviously putting the break in between that long building um, would certainly, it's certainly helpful as well. Um, I also, I do have a question, I guess I'll just ask. I, I, so Samantha, I'm wondering if you can answer um, another question. Um, it's uh, it's shown on the north property line. There's a six foot tall uh, wood fence um, that's being proposed. Is the um, what is the ordinance? I mean, they are they able to do um, to do the extension on top of that six foot to get up to eight feet? Uh, by right, or does that need to be? I mean, can they do it by right, or does that need approval? That is a six foot bent. Um, so that yeah, would be. Yeah, I just, there was a. Yeah, go ahead. Right. The, you, no, the, the question, the, yeah, here's the question. There, the, okay. the neighbor on the north, I, I, I was reading in some correspondence, the neighbor was requesting an eight foot tall fence. And so um, I'm just wondering if can, is the applicant able to do a, go up to an eight foot tall fence by right, or does there need to be special approval for that? That would require a conditional fence permit, um, but the six feet is by right. Uh, that even with the two foot extension, uh, like the lattice on top of the fence, that's a that that's conditional um, fence permit. Yes. Um, could we? Um, can we make that as a condition uh, of this um, application that we that we would allow for an eight foot tall fence if the applicant um, desired that? Um, if that's the um, desire of the commission, yes. Okay. Um, so that would be my um, that that is that's what I would um, recommend is that we allow for the applicant to build a fence up to eight feet tall. Um, if they choose, um, uh, but um, just because that came from the neighbor, so I thought that would be something that we could, or that they could do if they chose to do that. Um, so yeah, it, all in all, I, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm much happier with the uh, with the project we have in front of us now than what we were looking at the last time um, it was before us, and. Um, that's in some in support of this project. So thank you. Thank you. Other commissioners, um, comments? Well, I have some. Yes. Um, so. Yes, thank you. Um, I also want to appreciate the applicant. Um, and I also want to uh, agree with Commissioner Spellman and Commissioner Dawson, as far as removing 13 and 30, I think we've definitely heard enough from the neighborhood, which is immediately impacted. And I also used to live in Seabright and um, agree that I would have, I would definitely be okay with removing 13 and 30 myself. Um, and also um, the eight foot fence idea was something that came up to me when I was reading and it makes a lot of sense. So I appreciate uh, Commissioner Nielsen for bringing that up as well because something that I was interested asking about. Um, the main thing I wanted to bring up was just, again, what kind of piggybacking off of what Commissioner Dawson was saying, 
around the um, replacement housing requirement uh, and the accounting for the inclusionary housing requirement. Again, with, since we are losing three affordable units and only gaining one, that just doesn't seem to be, make, that doesn't make the most logical sense if our goal at this point is to increase affordable housing in Santa Cruz. So um, I definitely, you know, it seems that the the requirement where the wording may is used, I think this would be a very important time to use the may and ask that the inclusionary housing not being part of the recommended housing requirement have it be separate and therefore getting two units. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? I have, uh, yes, Commissioner Greenberg. Um, I just wanted to um, to ask a quick question in, in terms of the walkway uh, bike path, uh, whether there were transportation studies done or the perspective from a, you know, transportation planning in terms of whether it would necessarily increase traffic um, or the likelihood, sorry, that uh, there would be increased pedestrian uh, and bike uh, bikes that would make it more dangerous for those pedestrians and bikers or whether it might reduce car traffic to some degree and that that's the reason for the general plan making these recommendations. But I don't know if that level of granularity in this particular project, you know, if it can be analyzed, uh, you know, at that scale. Um, but I just am curious about that. Um, though I also hear the concerns of the community um, around this. I think the sig it's significant, as um, Samantha mentioned, that the, the path can be closed in the evening um, and that there would be, you know, potentially eyes on the street in terms of the people um, living in these units in terms of questions around safety. Um, but I do hear the concern, and I'm curious about, again, from a planning perspective, transportation planning perspective, um, the, the danger to pedestrians and bikers from this path. Um, I also concur with some of my fellow commissioners on the significance of, you know, having eliminated uh, affordable units and needing to, to the best of, our, of our, the ability to replace those units and not to have um, replacements uh, you know, to have the inclusionary separate from the replacement units in order to maintain two, two uh, affordable units would be something I would support. So those are my two points. Uh, one is a question, the other is a concurring. Thank you. Would staff like to respond to the question around the transportation planning work that may have uh, relevance to the proposed walkway? Yes, uh, Chair Schiffer, and I can um, address some of the questions that have come up. Um, we don't have a study that looks at this site in particular and addresses the potential for, you know, increased um, pedestrian traffic, you know, how, if, how that would be increased by this connection. But um, um, we have seen it in other places in the city. And um, we do believe that that connection would provide an alternate route for people and would allow for people to cut through and, and um, more readily um, get to services and the coast. Um, also wanted to address, um, somebody had brought up uh, that there were three units on the property now and that we should um, replace those three units, um, the code specifically states that we can only get 50% of the bedrooms demolished as a replacement unit. So um, they're required to provide two bedrooms um, in this case because the majority mix of units is three bedrooms. They're required to provide that as a three bedroom unit. So um, even if you were to um, go the route of requiring a separate inclusionary unit from a replacement unit, um, we wouldn't be able to get three units from it, so you would still be limited to the two. Um, the parking space is, um, I think, uh, Commissioner Spellman and Commissioner Nielsen, um, you're correct, the back uh, parking space 
compact space, the compact size. Um, the back out space is uh, 22 and a half feet. Um, so it's a little bit less than what we would normally require of the 24, but it um, is still feasible from a vehicular movement perspective. And I think that's all I have. <laughs> okay, um, I have some comments. I really do want to stress my appreciation to the applicant for making uh, major changes to um, the original project. I think it's still a pretty intense use of the site, but I don't know how you can get nine units on the site without it being an intense use of the site. And I think that um, reducing the size of the units, reducing the size of the project really um, has made it much more, um, in, you know, made it much more acceptable from my perspective. Uh, let me say something about the walkway, um, bikeway, because when it's that connection, all along I was in favor of that, and I think that it's because of sort of a, the general principle that it's better to have more pedestrian pathways and bikeways, and then not that the you know it provides alternative transportation opportunities for people. But I think, you know, then we have to look at the specifics. And the specifics here is who is this going to serve? Um, there are other streets in the neighborhood. It's not providing access, improved access to anywhere except Sumner Street. And the people on Sumner Street almost universally don't want it. Um, they prefer their other ways of getting to the beach or getting to the commercial activities. So from my perspective, um, I, since there are, this is not a, a, a pedestrian or bike access that really opens up an area, provides connections that otherwise don't exist, and makes for, uh, you know, real, real encouragement of people using alternatives. I think from, as I can, the best I can figure is it really serves the uh, the people on Sumner Street, and for them, it's a matter of balancing is are uh, the benefits that it provides to make it easier for them to get to Seabright and back from Seabright worth the dangers that they see in terms of intrusions in their neighborhood <laughs> and safety concerns. So I'm willing to support um, removing those two, uh, two conditions. In terms of that require the, the pathway, in terms of the fence, it's interesting, um, the applicant hasn't asked to have an eight-foot fence, it's the neighbor. So I think it really comes to us, I don't, you know, we can ask the applicant if he's sympathetic to it. He does have but, his hand up. Okay, um, uh, let me just finish and then I'll, I'll call on him. Um, my sense is whether um, he's sympathetic to it whether we put it in the condition that he can apply or we don't put it in the condition that he can, that he can apply, he, he's able to apply. Anybody, you know, a, as a property owner, he can, uh, can apply for a conditional use permit. If we want, if we think that an additional two feet is worth doing, we should have a condition that requires him to apply. <coughs> and <coughs> it seems to me that's the way to provide the protection to the uh, for the neighbors if that's why we're doing it. So I hadn't really focused on that, but I think if other commissioners feel that this um, uh, higher fence is a, an amenity that should be allowed um, to provide better neighborliness, then I think we need to have a condition that would um, require, at least require the applicant to apply for it. Um, let me just say one final thing before I call on the applicant about the affordable units. I ter certainly understand the wording of the ordinance that um, the most that the, that the city could require is two units, uh, affordable units. I'm concerned about, you know, when we make decisions, we're setting precedent. And I can't think of situations where um, the city would, would exercise discretion to require that the inclusionary units be counted separate from the replacement units in a, in a situation in, 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 
where if it wouldn't require it when we're getting we're, when the net effect is losing units. So I think from my perspective, we need to set the precedent that if we're going to lose affordable units, to the extent they can be replaced through the replacement housing ordinance, they should be. Um, I understand it's a hardship for the developer, and um, you know I appreciate that as a concern. I appreciate that lowering the uh, square footage of the units does re uh, reduce their uh, will reduce their rent levels. But on the other hand, I think we're setting a, a there's a very important principle at work here as we we're getting more and more higher density developments, more and more conversions of properties. Um, that are supposedly underutilized, at least in terms of the zoning and general plan, we're likely to see more um, developments where existing housing is being demolished. And it seems to me um, that in those situations, we need to have a good precedent that says, if the uh, certainly, if the um, total number of affordable units is going to be less after the project than before the project, the inclusionary unit should not count. Um, as replacement units. So that's my, you know, uh, position on that. I'm going to call on the applicant's representative and then Commissioner Conway. This is Derek Van Alstyne again. Uh, I, uh, I actually tried to respond earlier and one was unable to, uh, so evidently uh, it didn't get registered. So. Uh, there's very little that I have to say except that uh, I feel that as though the uh, th this is going to be uh, not being able to combine the the uh, affordable unit and and the replacement units is, is going to be a is going to be a crucial step for us. I think we'd have to stop and analyze it and see what uh, what it will take to make that work. The uh, the. Uh, I think that's all I have to say for the moment. Would you respond to the uh, question about the uh, fence, increasing the fence? Would you object to a condition that would um, be that you would uh, apply for a conditional fence permit to go up to eight feet? Do you have any objection to that, or do you think? That I don't. I don't have any specific objection to it. I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm I'm perfectly willing to. I think, and we'd be willing to t talk to the uh, to the neighbor about it. Um, and I think, as you mentioned, it can be done with a conditional fence permit just about any time. I would. I wouldn't want to see it conditioned without talking to my client. Okay. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Commissioner Conway. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you. Um, yeah, this is this project is a big change for the neighborhood, and um, an infill project of this type has a big impact. And I want to thank the applicant for really listening uh, to the neighbors uh, and to the planning commission. Um, this is this project is it's still going to represent a significant change, obviously, but it is are superior in terms of fitting in with the character of the neighborhood and providing that um, those diversity of housing types that we were really asking for. Um, and plus, I just think it looks a whole lot better. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and I would like to make a very strong uh, plea uh, for not abandoning the connectivity um, and I hear what everybody is saying. I understand concerns. And um, I disagree. Well, first of all, let me just say that um, a lot of development, urban development all over the country, but certainly in Santa Cruz, that uh, was enamored for a time of cul-de-sac um, patterns. And what it required, it, it assumed the car-dependent um, community. We're trying to move away from that. And that's why all of the policies that Samantha um, specified are in place. Um, and any opportunity that there is to improve connectivity needs to be taken really seriously. Of course, ha and also have to be balanced with concerns. Um, but I think assuming that 
uh, residents of Sumner Street are the only ones who are going to benefit from that connectivity, I think it's short-sighted. I know that for um, a time I lived on, in that neighborhood for a long time. Um, I lived on James Street. And I, I had family on Sumner, not far from this, um, and also right around the corner. Um, and I think it, you know, the to be able to easily walk or bike uh, to connect to that um, part of the neighborhood gets people out of cars. Um, and that's the point. Not everybody can hop on a bike to go down and get their pizza, um, you know, but uh, allowing people a pedestrian access, I think is a tremendous enhancement. And I think that those policies um, that the city has adopted are tremendously important. And I think it would be a shame to miss the opportunity to improve the connectivity. Um, I do very strongly support it being um, lockable um, and not necessarily open all night. Um, that's my point on that one. Um, and on the affordability, I have to say that I don't agree with adding um, additional affordable units. Of course, we need them desperately. Um, and we also need units desperately. Um, this was an unusual approach to creating them. Um, I appreciated the unusual approach because I think it brings us um, a depth of affordability in perpetuity that um, we don't get from the older homes on that um, on the site now. Um, and I think that, well, we can't deny the project because it's consistent with our policies. And I think to um, add this layer of affordability is risky because it really does make the project infeasible. Uh, and I would, um, again, make a plea for wanting to see this project get built um, as being of paramount importance and getting the two deed-restricted in perpetuity uh, units along with the much smaller units, making them more affordable by design, um, makes this project um, a very valuable project to the housing stock and um, and meets the affordability requirements. Thank you. Other commissioners have anything they want to say? Um, my, you know, my, again, my sense is our job is to carry out the policies in the general plan and to make sure the policies in the general plan and the zoning ordinance are carried out. Um, I would hope that the project would be feasible, even with two affordable units. Um, and but I don't think that's our business. Our business is to set good public policy. And losing affordable units just does not seem to be good, uh, good pub public policy. So I appreciate the comments that Commissioner Conway has said, but I think it's really the, we do have a terrible crisis and we need to, uh, we're gonna be losing three lower, uh, three units that are affordable. And that's, that's, a, that's significant in a, uh, in a city that has the kind of housing crisis that we have. And, um, you know, I think getting nine units, getting seven of them being um, market rate units uh, does deal with the problem overall, but it, it, it still is increasing, although to a more minimal level, the affordability problems that we have. So um, I see Commissioner um, Maxwell's hand up. Um, are you ready to make a motion, Commissioner Maxwell? Go yes, ahead. I am. Yes, I am. Yes, um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation with the following directions. One, uh, that the replacement uh, requirement housing not be counted as an inclusionary housing requirement, and uh, also to remove number 13 and 30 uh, regarding the uh, walk. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Uh, is that Commissioner Dawson? Are you seconding it? 
Yes, I'd, I'd second that motion. Okay, now we're going to have discussion. Uh, Commissioner Greenberg, you had your hand up? Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering if we could separate those into two different things. Yes, we so can. they have to be joined? Okay. Um, when, when we vote, we'll vote on them separately. The motion is a, to approve the staff recommendation with the uh, added condition that the uh, replacement housing unit, uh, unit not be counted as an inclusionary unit and um, that uh, uh, two conditions, 13 and 30, that require the pedestrian pathway be removed. Uh, Commissioner okay. Dawson, did you want to follow up with uh, uh, comments, and then Commissioner Greenberg, if you come back, you can get back. I did. Um, uh, moving towards a, a non-car centric um, way of getting around is not really a choice. I mean, we certainly have to move that way, and that's why I bike everywhere. However, as a resident of Seabright who um, rides across that street, down that street, um, it is a, a, a real safety issue, and I'm actually concerned about tourists and other people who don't know the neighborhoods who might be riding around on jump bikes and think that it's a good idea to come onto Seabright. It's a very unsafe for both pedestrians. I know that it's been improved. I know that the crosswalks have been put in. It is still quite a challenge to cross that street or ride down that street safer, safely. And so my concern about moving 1330 isn't as much as the petty crime thing. It's the actual safety of encouraging people um, to, to use that thoroughfare um, on their bikes or walking. So I just want to throw that last thing in about that. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner yeah. Green? Sorry. Yes, I should have raised my hand. Um, I hear that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I just, I guess I wish sort of similar to our previous discussion on wishing that there was, you know, additional study here. Um, I just am not convinced that that will exacerbate, you know, will create more of a danger for people. Um, because if in fact it results in keeping more cars off the road, that could, you know, that could alleviate some of the pressure on seat rights. And I feel like we just don't, and if so, if as uh, Commissioner Conway was suggesting, people not only on Sumner but adjoining areas feel that they can now access Seabright to do their shopping and what have you, there'll be fewer cars from surrounding neighborhoods going on to Seabright, potentially. I, I just don't know. And so I feel like it's not for me um, to make that uh, decision that it would exacerbate um, the safety issues. And I felt like a lot of the concerns from neighbors surrounding safety at having to do with crime could be mitigated by allowing for the walkway to be closed at night. And uh, I would imagine to have good lighting and so forth um, around it. Um, so, so that, so I would, I appreciate that these will be two separate um, motions, I, I think, right, if, if I understand uh, Chair Schiffer, um, that we can vote separately. Voted on mm -hmm. separately. Okay. Um, and then I also, um, I, you know, I recognize that these are unusual times and that this is a question of policymaking and setting a precedent for what happens when we eliminate existing affordable units, whether it's around Seabright, whether it's downtown. I feel like this is going to be a big issue when we get to discussions around downtown development as well, um, and that we really, um, you know, in terms of the recommendation we're making to council, um, that we let it be known that we, uh, and insofar as there is that uh, leeway within the policy around May versus shall, that we, uh, that we set this precedent and say that we expect to the greatest extent possible um, these units be replaced. Uh, and not have the uh, inclusionary mixed in with, with that replacement. So um, I, um, I would support that separate from the issue of the pathway. Thank you. Other commissioners uh, comment? Commissioner Conway. I, just, I appreciate you uh, being willing to uh, break it into several motions, and I was going to ask if you could break it into three motions, uh, support for the project, uh, support for uh, or uh, denying the uh, pathway 
and then break the affordability one separately. And um, uh, let's see, I, I did want to make one other point and uh, agree with you that policies are important and we have decades of policy that make uh, it very difficult to build housing. And um, my advocacy would be to uh, set policies that make it feasible to build housing. Thank you. Chair Schiffern, could I make a couple points also? Go right ahead. To clarify, um, the units that are on the site now are not designated affordable units. Um, they are occupied by tenants who are um, meet that income level, but they're not restricted in terms of who can live there. So technically they're not restricted affordable units. Um, I just want to make sure that was clear. Um, and then um, the other thing I wanted to ask is if you do um, make a motion to not approve the pedestrian walkway, um, if you could have that be sort of broad. I've, I've noticed that it's in a few of the conditions and um, if you could just make a motion to not um, accept the pedestrian pathway as part of the project, then I can go through the conditions um, with a fine tooth comb and make sure I collect all the reference address specific conditions of approval. Okay. Um, so we've got a bunch of requests here. We have a motion on the floor um, that would uh, ap recommend approval of the project with uh, changes to uh, two of the conditions, adding a condition regarding the replacement housing and uh, deleting two of the conditions. Would that have to do with the walkway? Is it uh, acceptable to the maker of the and the skin to uh, uh, change the language on the walkway to just um, recommend elimination of the pedestrian walkway from the project? and have that reflected in the conditions. Is that acceptable to the uh, maker of the motion the second? Because that's what I'm hearing. Yes, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Is that okay with the second as well? Yes, agreed. I give you what you want, uh, Samantha? Okay. Um, then in terms of, um, I guess, to satisfy everybody, or uh, at least procedurally, um, why don't we sort of take it that the motion on the floor is to approve the recommendations, uh, the staff recommendation. There's an amendment to uh, add a requirement that the affordable unit um, not be counted as an, uh, the replacement housing affordable unit not be counted as an inclusionary unit. So why don't we vote on that uh, as sort of uh, separately, and then we'll vote on the walkway thing separately. And then, if they're, you know, if they if they pass, they're going to become part of the motion. So um, I don't see how we can vote on the, the motion separately if it's going to include these conditions if they should pass. So um, could we have a roll call vote on the? Excuse me, I don't think I quite understood that. I, I, so I, I'm not sure I, I quite understood what you said. Um, are, are you suggesting that we can't vote on this project setting those two amendments aside? You think um, that we can't vote on it that way? Um, because I don't want to approve the project and then not be able to vote on the two, two, two um you know, conditions. Normally, that's what you're asking for wouldn't happen. I mean, we could separate voting on one and voting on to the other. To set aside two. Uh -huh. Aren't we, aren't, I, I'm not sure I understand because it seems not uncommon to say that we have two points, two, two conditions um, that we know we have a difference of opinion on and to set those aside and vote on just the pro support of the project itself. It seems typical, well, but then you're or not uncommon, at least. 
those conditions. And I think there are people who don't want to support the project without the conditions, that they'd only support the project with okay. conditions. So that's the, you see the problem that kind of which comes first. I, I see how you're setting it up. Yeah, absolutely. We have to deal with the chicken first. I don't so, think it has to be set up that way, but I do understand. Okay. So um, why don't we vote on the the condition to um, require that the replacement housing uh, unit not be counted as one of the inclusionary units. Does everybody understand that? So let's have a roll call vote on that. I'm sorry, I don't understand it. So you're um, basically wanting to vote just on the condition or approval of the project, including that specific that condition. condition. Just the condition. Because we've been asked to separate out. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to be so, clear that, okay, so it's just the condition. So um, we'll vote on the condition as an amendment to the motion on the floor. I'm going to treat it as if the motion on the floor is um, approve the project. There are two amendments. One would be to add a condition having to do with the replacement housing units not be counted. The other would be to add a condition um, that would uh, eliminate the, the pedestrian uh, require the pe pedestrian walkway requirement. So we're first going to vote on the amendment to deal with the replacement housing unit. Thank you. So does that make sense? Yes. Let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Conway. No. Greenberg. Aye. Spellman? No. Maxwell? Aye. Nielsen? No. Dawson? Aye. Chipren? Aye. The uh, motion passes four to three. So now we'll vote on the uh, uh, proposed amendment to the motion, the main motion um, that would um, uh, eliminate the pedestrian walkway and have the conditions changed to reflect that. Um, any questions about this, what's being voted on? Okay, let's have a roll call vote. Mr. Conway? No. Greenberg? No. Spellman? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Schifrin? Aye. The motion passes uh, five to two. Uh, we now have the, the motion on the floor is to approve the staff recommendation with the two uh, conditions that have been amended into it regarding the affordable units and the um, w uh, pedestrian walkway. So we can have, if, if, if there's no further discussion on the, uh, the amended motion, can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Conway? I, and I want to thank you for providing the opportunity to uh, separate those pieces. Greenberg? I and I echo Julie on that point. Spellman? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Schifrin? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Um, thank you all very much. It's a complex project. Thank, uh, thank you, staff, for all your help um, and appreciate the uh, time that we spent to try to see how close we can get to agreeing with each other. Um, we're now on information items. Are there any information items? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, so a couple things. Uh, first off, the, the project at 418 
through 508 Front Street. It's a 175-unit mixed-use development between Front Street and the levy. We currently have a draft environmental impact report out for review with the comment period concluding on June 24th. Comments can be made through the city's website. We're expecting that hearings on this project will likely occur in the July and August timeframe with the project needing to go to the Historic Preservation Commission and the Planning Commission before council. Of course, that timeframe is dependent on how many comments we receive and how long it will take the consultant to respond to those comments. At the May 12th council meeting, the city council unanimously approved the 111 Eric Circle project. They actually approved both alternatives, and this was a request by the applicant just prior to the council meeting. They were considering a modified alternative to where the multifamily unit portion could or would be detached condominium units. They had some real conceptual sketches, and the council chose to approve both alternatives with the caveat that if the applicants pursue alternative two, that the site plan and the infrastructure plan has to return to the council for final approval. They gave authority to staff to approve the designs of the individual units, assuming that the site plan gets approved. So that action was taken. Also on that agenda, the council took action on the 1930 Ocean Street extension project. Some of the commissioners who aren't familiar with this project, I'll give you a brief background. It was approved by council back in September of 2018. It included a general plan amendment and a rezoning to basically increase density on that site for a 32-unit project that included a tentative map, a design permit, and a plan development permit. There was an EIR prepared for that particular project. Shortly after its approval, there was a lawsuit filed against the applicants and the city by the Ocean Street Extension Neighborhood Association, who challenged the city certification of the EIR, as well as how the plan development permit was approved. That essentially allowed a reduction in the slope setback. Last January, the court upheld the EIR that was certified, but it remanded or directed that the city rescind the slope setback portion of the plan development permit. Without getting into the nitty-gritty details of the decision, there are a number of ways that the applicants can address this particular order from the court. At this point, we're waiting to hear as to how the applicant wants to proceed. This project could very well be back before you at some point in time. At the May 26th council meeting, the city council appropriated $310,000 that the city received from an SB2 grant in order to engage consultants to develop objective development standards for multifamily residential and mixed-use housing. Then they directed staff to report back at key project milestones. The RFP was recently released, and the schedule has staff selecting a consultant by August. Then that contract would need to go to the city council for final approval. Looking out at the upcoming schedule, for your next meeting on June 18th, we've got a project involving a slope variance. Then also, you might be receiving an update from Tiffany Weiss West on the West Cliff Drive plan. Then out in July, there are some cleanup zoning code amendments that 
we're looking at processing, so um, there will likely be hearings in July on that. And that's all I have. Thank you. Um, I'd like to add a couple of things uh, related. From my perspective, the decision on the Ocean Street Extension Project uh, was very significant because one of the concerns I have with the way uh, staff uses the plan development permit is that it makes a mockery out of the zoning ordinance. It's so easy to uh, get an exception to almost anything and call it a plan development. And what the court essentially said is that maybe you can get away with that with most things, but you can't get away with that with, for slope, with the slope regulations. And the city, um, in approving the project, essentially said, well, we're going to use the PD um, instead of requiring the applicant to get a variance for the slope regulations. And the court did say it's a different chapter. You can't do that. I think it was a very useful decision in terms of trying to set some limits in terms of what the PD can be used for. And the, what, the, what it really means is if the applicant can move the project so that it doesn't need a slope variation, uh, a slope variance, then it doesn't have to come back to the Planning Commission. If they can't, the, the, as um, uh, Mr. Marlett was saying, the Commission and ultimately the Council maybe would have to vote on whether to grant the variance for that project. Um, the other thing I'd like to uh, ask uh, Mr. Mollett is whether on the objective standard item the council gave any direction or indicated any role for the planning commission in the um, development of objective standards. Um, nothing, nothing specific to the motion. Um, the staff report, which I would encourage all the commission to, to read, um, does uh, speak to um, various points in time or scenarios where the Planning Commission may be involved throughout the process. Um, we know that uh, amending or that, that uh, uh, adopting the objective development standards is going to require an amendment to the zoning ordinance, which you, of course, will have a role in, um, depending upon um, what comes out of the consultant's initial work, um, which is going to include an evaluation of what we have on the books and what, that, what that's yielding in terms of housing. Um, you know, there, there could very well be um, recommendations to, to change the general plan, and, and if that were the case, you would be involved in that as well. So uh, nothing per se. Um, if I could speak to the Ocean Street Extension Project, um, the, the, the plan development ordinance clearly uh, allows slope setbacks to be modified. Um, there, there's no question. Um, what the judge uh, expressed concern with was a provision in a slope ordinance that prohibits uh, lots from being created that requires the house from being located 20 feet from a 30% slope. Um, the city was of the opinion that house infer single family residential, not condominium units. The judge didn't agree, but that that was really the, the basic point of contention um, in that portion of the lawsuit. Well, having read it over, the judge's opinion over, um, it, it's a, it was a complex issue. That's not quite the way I understood it, but that's fine. The final point I wanted to make was that uh, the Draft EIR for the Wharf Master Plan, um, the comment period has, has ended. And so, as I understand it, once the final EIR is done, the Wharf Master Plan and the final EIR would be coming to the Planning Commission before it goes to the Council. Is that correct, Mr. Marlett? Um, I, um, I would need to confirm that. I, I can't say for sure. I think it said that in the EIR, but it was yeah, I haven't been directly involved with that, um, but I can certainly um, uh, get back to you on that, for the entire commission for that matter. Would you please, and would you also please send the all the commissioners a copy of the staff report you referred to that went to the city council? Yes. 
Okay, so um, anybody else have any information items? Are there any subcommittee advisory body oral reports? Yes, uh, Commissioner Conway. Yeah, I'd like to uh, give an update on the Affordable Housing Subcommittee. Um, this uh, scheduling, this subcommittee has certainly been uh, delayed due to COVID, um, but it is back on track and uh, we expect to be getting together very soon. Um, we don't have an exact date yet, but um, uh, we'll be getting together soon. Um, I did speak with staff today and I would like to get an answer as quickly as possible on the, um, we've got two main areas of work. One of them is um, around the section eight, working on the inclusionary ordinance. Um, is about the use of Section 8. Um, a lot of work has been done on that already. I would hope that we could move that quickly. The other one is um, the uh, workforce housing, um, which is definitely more complex. Work has started on it, but I think it's going to take um, some, uh, you know, a, a fair amount of work. I uh, do plan on the um, next report that I give, I'd like to uh, have a nailed down a work plan and a timeline um, for completing the subcommittee's work. And um, I'll do that the next opportunity. So you'll submit that to the commission? I'll be making the, yeah, the next time as I'll be, I'll make a report to the next commission. The next, the, 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 um, an oral, I'll just do another oral report. And, um, unless maybe there'll be an opportunity to um, have it written up as a memo, but I'm no guarantees. Well, I would, uh, if it's at all possible, I would appreciate it just because it's useful to get the reports and something like that. It's such an important subcommittee to get the report in writing in advance. Yeah. To be, you know, we could think about it. Uh, Commissioner Greenberg, did you raise your hand? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add that. Um, in our initial, um, and there was kind of an original meeting about the subcommittee and what we were going to focus on, and it sounded like from my from looking back over the emails, there were three areas of focus. One was the inclusionary ordinance. One was enhancing the density bonus, which we're not, um, we didn't end up focusing on. Another was variety of housing types. And I think what we ended up doing was shifting towards focusing on the inclusionary ordinance and then related to that, the workforce housing. And that may be all that we can do um, in the time that we have. We did also, and it seemed relevant given our discussion today, the discussion of variety of housing types um, being something that we might address. And, you know, but I also understand that subcommittees are subcommittees and, you know, these are ongoing issues, questions of affordable housing um, only so much can be done with this particular subcommittee. Um, but I would hope that the, the, the issues surrounding um, and recommendations that our commission might have around the variety of ways to really move the needle on affordable housing in our, in our community um, could be brought to the, to the commission in a variety of ways. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll see how much, I, I don't know what the time limit is on this subcommittee. Um, and what's realistic in terms of what we can address um, within that time frame. But insofar as there are other agenda items we might want to include, we think of other ways um, to do research and or you know, enable us as a commission to have recommendations along those lines. As I understand it, and this is when I first got on the commission, this is what was happening in terms of the subcommittee that participated in development um, review meetings with the public. Uh, the com the, in order for the subcommittee not to be required to meet the requirements of the Brown Act, can't be in existence for more than six months. But it can be reestablished after that six month period is, is gone. So maybe in your report, Commissioner Conway, you can clarify when that six month, the current six month yeah. period is then the commission can yeah. discuss how it wants to reestablish the uh, subcommittee. Yeah, and I think that the, um, 
the timeline is is a, a really important issue, and um, we could apply we 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 could request an extension. And certainly, there's been extraordinary circumstances that it seems to me would warrant an extension. Uh, uh, but yeah, we'll talk about that uh, at the next update. I don't know if the governor uh, passed an order that would extend the <laughs> subcommittees beyond their six-month lifetime <laughs> to avoid the Brown Act, but that um, I'll, I look forward to hearing about that. So any other uh, subcommittee advisory body reports? I don't have any report on the, the Westcliff project somehow. Um, I don't know whether I fell off the, the boat or the boat's not moving, but um, I guess we'll hear at our next meeting from Tiffany Wise West what's going on. Um, I'm sure the process is continuing with the consultants working away, even if the committee isn't really doing very much. Um, it's hard to get a whole 25-member committee together when during, this, during the pandemic, so I don't have a report. Any uh, items to refer to future agendas? Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you all very much. Goodbye.